In the late 70s, I recall visiting our grandparents' house. They lived in a holler about a 20-minute drive away from the nearest town. When going to their house, you would turn off a main road onto a rocky road. I always knew when the turn was coming because there was a little mom-and-pop type store right on the side of the road. This store was really the sort of thing you would never see nowadays. It was a very small, old, gray building. There was a very old drink cooler sitting out on the porch, and it was very small inside. There was a counter, some coolers, some shelves with some simple groceries on them. It was truly the definition of what a small country store was. By the counter, they also had boxes of candy that cost about 10 cents, if I remember correctly. My cousins and I used to always walk down to the store and buy boxes of candy whenever we had a dime or two on us. That was what was going on this day. I was 10 years old at the time. My cousin was the same age as me, basically. We decided to walk down the road to the store, get some pop and get some candy as well. Now, it was a little bit of a walk. It took us quite a while to get there, but it wasn't something we hadn't done before. This time, though, something very different happened. A car pulled up the street with an older guy in the driver's seat. He stopped right by us and asked us what we were doing. We had never seen the guy around before, and we knew most of the people in this area. We simply told him we were going to the store to grab some candy. The guy insisted we let him drive us there. My cousin and I enjoyed the walk, though, and we knew that we didn't get in the car with people we didn't know. We turned him down immediately, but he kept trying to get us to follow him for a while. Finally giving up, the man who was downright creepy then drove off. Now, the little store didn't really have a parking lot. It was more like you would just park out front at any time you wanted. We got close and saw the guy from the car was not only parked right there, he was sitting on the porch swing drinking a tall bottle of Mellow Yellow. When we arrived at the store, he tried to talk to us again, letting us know he would be happy to drive us home once we were done. Needless to say, my cousin and I were extremely uncomfortable. The guy was so persistent. As we walked into the store, the man called out behind us, I'll be waiting for you. We told the shop owner what was going on. I can't recall her name, but she was immediately concerned. She called our parents and my dad drove down to the store to pick us up. Apparently, when my dad showed up, the man immediately jumped into his car and left. We found out when we got older that this man had been accused several times of doing things to boys that lived in the area. I really believe it, based off the way he was behaving. I don't know what would have happened if we got into the car, or if we tried to walk home without calling my dad, but I do know it would not have been good. I never really got scared of very much. I would often do things that probably might scare other people without really thinking about it. One thing I always did and even do nowadays is take walks at nighttime. I'm a night person like I'm sure many people are and my mind just works better when it's dark outside. I started taking walks in the dark a lot of times really late at night when I was really young. This happened when I was around 14 years old. Me and my family lived in an old house, way out in the country on a hillside. Although the house itself was really nice, it did not have air conditioning. So in the summertime, all we had to keep ourselves cool were fans and open windows. Today, I much prefer cold weather, and I live in a cooler climate because of that. Back then, and today, if it's too warm, I won't have any chance of getting to sleep. I shared a bedroom with my brother when we lived in this house. We had the windows open and had one box fan. 
On this summer night, I was very uncomfortable and I could not go to sleep. I got up and tried to watch some television. I always liked the shows that came on late at night, such as Freddy's Nightmares or Tales from the Dark Side. Even watching those was not enough to make me forget about just how hot it was inside. I checked and it was a much cooler temperature outside than it was inside, so I decided I would go out and go for a walk. It had to be around midnight when I went out. Everyone else was in bed, and I didn't tell anyone where I was going. It wasn't that big a deal though. There was nothing around our house but hills and trees, some gravel roads and the like. It wasn't like there was anyone around to mug me or something like that. I was just hoping a walk in the cooler air would tire me out enough to be able to sleep when I got home. I walked on the side of the gravel road. There wasn't a shoulder per se, but there was some normal ground on both sides of the road. While walking on the gravel, even in shoes, it could be very uncomfortable. So I walked on the side and enjoyed it. I went pretty far down, but no further than I had ever gone before. I eventually decided to turn around and head back toward the house. Right as I turned around, the most interesting thing happened. A small black cat came running down the road that I hadn't turned down and ran right up to me. I always liked cats, although we didn't have one, so I stopped to pet this kitty. The cat was very receptive, and I almost didn't want to stop playing with them, but I knew I had to get home before I was out there for too long. As I began walking away, the cat decided it wasn't ready to give up on me. Instead, she began walking alongside me. The cat kept up with me as I walked, its little legs working fast so it wouldn't fall behind. Honestly, it was very cute. As we know with cats, they can pretty much decide who they want to be with, and I sort of had a feeling this cat was going to be following me for a while. As we walked along, something began to distract the cat. She stopped, and because I was paying close attention to her, I stopped and tried to see what she was looking at. Something obviously seemed to be annoying her. She was hissing at some unseen thing in the woods. It made me a little nervous, thinking something bad might be out there, but I couldn't see or hear anything myself. After a few moments, I was able to convince the cat to go ahead and start walking with me again. I began to wonder though, what could have possibly annoyed this little cat so much? I also thought that whatever it was, it must have made my imagination begin to run away with me. I actually began thinking I was hearing someone or something walking around in the woods to the side of me. The longer I walked, the more I thought I was hearing these things. I did begin to feel a little bit scared for the first time, but the presence of that cat walking beside me made me feel much better. The next time I heard something though, it definitely sounded like there really was something out in the woods following me. The cat noticed it too. She immediately took a stance very similar to the one she had before and began growling and hissing at something. It was exactly the way she had been acting before. I was convinced that whatever she was hissing at, it was definitely following us. I didn't know what it could have been, a human or an animal, but I knew I needed to get home as quickly as possible. I would have picked the cat up and ran with her, but I didn't want to startle or scare her. I tried to hurry as much as possible without leaving the cat behind. I could tell she wasn't fully grown yet, so she was really struggling to keep up. Honestly, I was almost considering this cat mine now. The rest of the walk home was very unnerving. I kept hearing things out in the woods, but decided that if none of it was bothering the cat enough to stop, I was probably okay. I just hurried along and tried my best to ignore everything I was hearing. I was happy when I almost arrived back to my home. It had a really big yard and driveway, so even though I was in the backyard, it was still a little bit of a walk in the dark to get there. I half expected the cat to leave me, because she'd successfully escorted me home. She didn't though. She followed me right up to the house. I decided to reward this little kitty for her escort mission. 
I couldn't bring her in the house right away though, since none of my family knew about her, and would be shocked there was this random cat in our house. If they noticed her while I was sleeping, who knew what they would do? I was sure she would wait for me as I went inside though. I got a bit of lunch meat and a bowl of water, and went back outside. The cat was still there like I'd thought, but she was very agitated now. She was looking off to the side of the house toward the fence that separated our yard from the woods. When I looked over there, at first I couldn't see anything, but as I looked a little bit longer, I detected some movement out by the fence. There was someone or something out there in the darkness, and it was clearly distressing this poor little cat quite a lot. It was when I saw a rush of movement and a figure trying to climb over the fence that I realized this was a person and I figured it must be a person who was up to something bad. I had a rifle I kept in the garage, so I ran to grab it. I hoped the guy, whoever he was, would see that gun and get scared and run off. I didn't really want to fire it. By the time I got back with it, the guy was much closer. I could see him a lot better. He was really ratty looking, almost like he was homeless or something. He saw me with gun in hand and paused. It was then that I noticed he had a large hunting knife in his hand, and a chill went down my spine. Get off our property, I warned him. The man took a step toward me, as if he was daring me to fire. I didn't do anything until he stepped even closer. I fired the gun at him. I didn't hit him, but it acted as a warning shot. A warning shot I hoped he would take very seriously. The guy turned around and ran back to the fence, he jumped over it and disappeared into the night. The rifle shot, of course, woke my dad and family up. My dad came out onto the porch, and I had to explain to him what just happened. He took the rifle and told me to take the cat inside. He went to check out the sides of the fence to make sure the guy was really gone. We didn't figure out who the guy was or why he was carrying a knife around in the dark like he did. My dad thought that with the cat's reaction, maybe he was abusing it or something. There were some pretty sick people out there who did that sort of stuff to animals. Maybe the cat had gotten away from him. Maybe he just wanted to attack me, but we didn't think we'd have a problem with him from then on, since he knew now we had guns in the house. We adopted the cat and called her Midnight. She was the best pet I ever had. I kept her indoors, though, just in case that guy ever tried to come back for her. I think she could have taken care of herself, though. Hi, I'm 22 and female. I'm from Hawaii and live on the more countryside of my island, where not even Google Maps can tell you exactly where I live. To put it very simply, I live out in the boonies, and people who don't live by me don't ever come into this neighborhood, unless they're extremely lost. I'm only saying that for context. About three days ago, I was in my driveway, on my way to catch the bus to work. That was until this strange catering truck came driving directly toward my house and pulled right into my driveway. A middle-aged man came out, wearing a tacky Aloha shirt only tourists would be seen wearing, and dirty khaki shorts and run-down sandals. He looked dirty to say the least, looked like he hadn't scrubbed down in days. He asked me if I wanted to buy meat or seafood. I said no thanks. He then asked if anyone else was home. I lied and said my uncle was, hoping he would go away. These kinds of trucks don't come anywhere near my side of the island, by the way. He refused to leave. He started complimenting my looks, saying how I had nice hair, then going on about how beautiful island girls are, our curves, and other creepy stuff like that. When my neighbor stepped outside to see what was going on, he ran back to his truck and drove away. Yet, once I turned the corner to catch my bus... There he was. He then slowly drove behind me. I felt sketched out and called my mom who's a dispatcher. I told her what happened and how he looked, and she told me she'd handle it. 
By that time, more people started coming out of their homes, so he decided to just leave. Two hours later, I was at work when she told me she got a couple of other calls about that same guy, exact same description as me. I was asked to go down to the station to see if I recognized anyone. I pointed out his picture in a lineup. They confirmed that this man was a well-known sex trafficker that they hadn't been able to get a hold of for weeks now. Since then, I locked my house as soon as my mom left for work, and I haven't slept well since. I've been throwing up and having panic attacks every time I leave time for myself to think. I'm scared of this guy, and I don't know what to do. He knows where I work, my house, my face. It scares me to the point I've even covered up my windows, just in case someone might be trying to look inside. A couple of years back, my best friend and I went on a road trip to the States for a music festival. We met up with some friends and saw a lot of things and whatnot. One of our friends came back home with us. He needed to get back home for school, and his buddies didn't want to head back just yet. We decided to drive straight home, and did it in shifts. It took about 24 hours for the full drive. My story starts when I was driving the night shift, at about 2 a.m. or so. It was a beautifully clear night. Full moon, no clouds, middle of summer. While observing all these conditions, I also noticed that our GPS had turned us down a back road, and we'd driven into a very large valley. There were open fields on every side, and not another car or house in sight. It's important to note that we had not seen anyone or anything even relating to human presence for a few hours. Upon entering this valley, we lost our satellite signal as well. Now we had no satellite radio, no GPS, and no cell signal. I figured that it didn't really matter. I knew that if we followed this road for a couple more hours, we'd eventually get out. About 20 minutes after entering this valley, and after having lost all our connections, we came upon a bridge. As we got closer, I saw a car pulled onto the side of the road. Not uncommon, I guess. People have to sleep, and they pull off to the side of the road when they really need to. What is uncommon is that this car had all of its windows completely blacked out. With all the light from the moon, we should have been able to see at least partially inside, but it was pitch black. Getting closer, we also realized there was no license plate. No big deal, we assumed it must have been an abandoned vehicle. That is, until we passed by, and the vehicle almost immediately turned its lights on and pulled out behind us onto the road. Now it started to get real creepy. The vehicle started tailgating us, out here in the middle of nowhere, with us unable to see who was inside, we started to freak out a bit. Okay, maybe he's lost and needs to follow someone out of the area, but that didn't explain the windows being blacked out. Or the lack of a license plate. With this car now following us, I started to have very uneasy feelings. Soon, I began to full-blown panic. I wanted to get away from this vehicle ASAP. I tried to push these feelings aside, as it seemed like a silly response to a possibly explainable situation. That is, until I observed something in the middle of the road. Coming closer, I could see what looked to be a body laying in the middle of the lanes. It was not a very big road, and like I said, it was also a back road. At this moment, and at the sight of what appeared to be a body in the road ahead, we really didn't know what to do. There was no way I was stopping for any reason, obviously, in this desolate and isolated area. There was no one to help us, and there were no vehicles around, other than the one now following us. There was no housing or lights as far as the eye could see. No cell service, no satellite, nothing. By the time we came upon the body, there was no room to go around. There were no shoulders on the road, and deep ditches on either side. 
we were close enough now to see that it was not a body at all. It was a scarecrow. I drove right over it and continued on. The car continued to follow us. I sped up and it sped up. I slowed down and it slowed down too. I decided to fully punch the gas. After about two minutes of this, the car eventually slowed down, did a U-turn, and then drove back in the opposite direction. My passenger then turned to me. I swear I saw spikes on that scarecrow earlier. Luckily for us, we were driving a very big truck, and the wheel span was bigger than the scarecrow on the road. We didn't really have to touch it much while driving over. It was another half hour before we reached cell services, and the satellite picked back up. It wasn't until we reached home at 5 a.m. that we remembered during this time there had been a couple of people missing, reported in our province. Ones who were on vacation and driving home, who never made it back and were never found. Me and my passengers fully believe we escaped some crazy Wolf Creek type of situation, we contacted the police about it and ended up making a full police report. However, we were unable to pinpoint the exact location. There wasn't anything they could really do other than file the report. We definitely didn't want this to happen to anyone else, as it was spooky as hell. Strap in, this is a decently long one. I'm a 23-year-old woman, and this story is about a 33-year-old man. Let's call him Greg. I met him at the gym about a year back or so. I used to go to the gym with my mother, and being an introvert, I very seldom used to engage with or even talk to people. Being in the gym since the last two years... I had seen Greg work out and never really caught him staring or even looking in my direction. He was a well-educated, well-spoken man, and I assumed that interacting with him would not pose any threat to me. One day, Greg just randomly walked up to me at the gym and asked to add me on Facebook so he could promote some things regarding his business. I didn't really think much of it, as I'm barely active on the platform anyway. I let him add me. Slowly, our interactions grew in the gym, as well as on social media. I was going through a rough patch, so I would often find myself looking for a friend or perhaps even more. From the very beginning, my mother did not seem to like Greg. She felt that something was off about him. Regardless, I chose to meet him and another mutual friend of ours from the gym for coffee. I wasn't romantically inclined towards Greg, but I wasn't totally opposed to it either. At coffee, our conversations were quite general. But on text, Greg would casually flirt with me a lot. I would just ignore it, but that turned out to be a big mistake. The more I spoke to Greg and the more I found out about him, the more I realized I didn't see any kind of future with him in it, not even as a friend. Eventually, I started backing off and took longer and longer to reply to his messages. I didn't want to blatantly confront him. After all, we did go to the same gym and I wanted to avoid any hostility. Greg also slowly backed off as well and we stopped talking altogether. Fast forward six months. I got my dream job and posted about it on Facebook. Greg congratulated me and told me he was proud of me. I gave him the benefit of the doubt and started replying to his texts again. He immediately began making flirtatious remarks toward me, but this time I told him flat out that made me uncomfortable and I didn't want to be involved with him romantically or sexually. Subsequently, the conversations died down and we parted on what I thought were cordial terms. He would often send me messages asking for feedback on some of his work, but I would generally ignore them. Now, in July of this year, Greg messaged me once more, asking for some feedback. He also sent another message asking whether I would like to withdraw from his broadcast list. I respectfully told him I would like to withdraw, 
since I didn't think I was qualified enough to give him appropriate feedback anyway. He went completely off on me, sending a bunch of messages, most of which I did not understand. I asked for context and he told me I was only getting that over a call. I agreed. Another mistake. We spoke for two hours, wherein I made it very clear that he was only a friend and nothing more. He agreed and was very respectful throughout. Because of that, I assumed there was no harm in simply talking to him. For a couple of weeks, we spoke as friends, before he started proposing me being a future work partner for a music venture. I was hesitant and would shoot his invitations to meet down by making various excuses. After about three weeks of this, he began making sexual remarks toward me. It made me uncomfortable, and I told him that I didn't want to talk to him anymore since we weren't on the same page. He started to get angry. He told me that if I wouldn't meet him, he didn't want to talk to me anymore either. I thought to myself, good riddance. I was getting increasingly tired of him calling me throughout the day and talking always about his inflated self-image. He told me something like he'd contact me after a year and we could meet then if I reconsidered my feelings toward him. I was growing impatient. I just wanted him out of my life. I was off my phone the next day for six to seven hours. When I came back, I was welcomed to numerous missed calls and messages, most of which were threatening in nature. He threatened to show up to my house and kill me and my family. This is when I realized I may need to involve my family and the police. I told my parents everything. They didn't immediately contact the police, though. These could just be empty threats from a man who wouldn't take no for an answer. The following day, Greg got my parents' numbers and started sending them threatening messages, claiming he would abduct me if they didn't make me marry him. We contacted the police. They went straight to Greg's home to investigate, but seeing his behavior, out on the roof half-naked, screaming at the sky, they declared him mentally unfit and told us he could not be arrested. We withdrew the complaint and contacted higher law authorities. Whilst we were awaiting a response, Greg allegedly committed a crime in a five-star hotel. He attacked a female employee and a guest with a knife and tried to re the employee. Consequently, an FIR was filed which led to Greg being admitted to a mental institution. He stayed there for a couple of days and now walks completely free. We were able to file another complaint against him, which was taken more seriously this time. However, we were advised not to create a case, as he would easily get off on bail. So he still roams free and still continues to contact me from unknown numbers every once in a while, making me feel like I'm under constant threat whenever I'm outside my house. When I was in the third grade, I remember answering the house phone to find my grandpa on the other line. We started chatting like we usually did, and then he asked me if he could walk me to school tomorrow. My grandpa lived in Florida, and we lived in New Jersey. What? Grandpa, you're all the way in Florida. He kept insisting he would be there to walk me to school tomorrow. After we said love you to one another, the man hung up. My mom came in confused and asked me who I was talking to. I excitedly told my parents that Grandpa was coming over tomorrow. They were very confused and asked me where I'd even gotten that idea from. I told them that Grandpa had just called and told me. They called up my actual grandfather and asked if he had called and spoke to me. He said no. I'll never forget the fright on their faces in that moment. We kept an eye out the next day, but no mysterious person seemed to come and try and abduct me or something. I was too scared to ever walk alone to school after that, though. I'll try to be as brief as possible and stick to the relevant events that are giving me this feeling. The latest event happened just last night, 
and I didn't get much sleep, so apologies if I ramble a bit. My wife and I recently purchased our first home, after the birth of our daughter. Everything was as you would expect for the first few months. Painting, decorating, renovating, basking in our newfound slice of the American dream. You get the idea. Unusual things started happening several months ago, though. One day, as I was just getting home after work, I passed by this strange truck, two or three houses down from ours. Now, I say strange for a few reasons. We literally know everyone in our small neighborhood, and I'd never seen this truck before. There was no reason for through traffic to come down our street, and the truck was driving very slowly. The sort of driving you'd get if you put the car in drive but didn't press on the gas at all. As I pulled into the driveway, the car immediately flipped a U-turn and came back towards my house. Getting out of my vehicle, the truck crawled by, and I could see the driver staring daggers at me as he passed. He then sped off. I don't like to judge based on appearances, and I'd like to think I don't scare that easily, but something about this guy's eyes gave me a bad feeling. Obviously, this was very weird. I mentioned what happened to my wife, telling her maybe we should be more mindful about security when I told her about the type of truck I'd seen. My wife had this to add. That same truck drove by and that guy stared at me when I got home this afternoon. I thought he was just being creepy and checking me out. I tried to tease her a bit to lighten the mood, calling her cocky for assuming any guy driving by must be checking her out. I didn't want her to get unnerved, but I was definitely freaking out a bit. We continued to see the truck multiple times over the next couple of weeks, either driving by slowly or parked just down the block and facing our yard. One day, the truck just stopped driving by, and we didn't see it ever since. I sort of dismissed the whole thing as me being paranoid because of that, but then other strange things started happening. In the past month or so, my wife and I have been hearing tapping on the windows at the front of our house at night. It's happened two or three times to each of us separately, always at exactly 10 or 11, always a soft and distinct tapping. It almost sounded like someone knocking with a single knuckle on the metal part of a screen door, if that makes sense. The first time that my wife and I heard the tapping together was just last weekend. We were in the front room playing with our daughter. It was around 9.30 or so. We were about to settle her down for bed. Our front room has a large, almost floor-to-ceiling window running the length of the wall next to the door. It faces the street. We were all sitting on the floor with our backs to that window, reading our daughter a book when we began to hear it. Now, our house is older, Creaks and cracks are not uncommon, but this sound was so distinct and intentional that my wife and I immediately looked at each other and bolted out of the room. Had my wife and daughter locked themselves in a back room while I turned on all the lights and did a sweep around the outside of the house. Of course, I didn't see anything. I was ready to dismiss this all as nothing more than paranoia or something that probably had an innocent explanation. That was until last night. Around 9.45, we heard our daughter making noise in the baby monitor. I waited a few minutes to see if she would settle down a bit, but when it became clear she would not, I got up to put her back to sleep. The layout of the room is important to visualize this next part. This room is on the side of our house, but the exterior wall juts out in a bit of an L shape, and the corner of the L is made up of windows. If you're standing in the door to the room, you're directly across from these windows. There's a rocking chair in the other corner pointed toward the front of the house. One window faces the street, the other faces our neighbor's house. A garden bed planted with small shrubs wraps around the outside directly underneath. I was sitting in that chair getting my daughter settled down. I had a lamp on so the room was softly lit. 
Munchie fell asleep, I stood up to put her in her crib, when something strange caught my eye. There was a figure standing about a foot away from the window, in the space between the shrubs and the house. They were staring in at us. I didn't look long enough to see anything more than what appeared to be a man in a light gray hoodie, standing a few feet away on the other side of the glass. Sprinting from the room, I brought my daughter back to my wife and I's bedroom, leaving her there while telling my understandably confused wife to lock the door. After turning off all the lights inside and turning on all the lights outside, I began moving from room to room, peering out the windows into the darkness. I couldn't see anything out of the ordinary. Whoever it was must have taken off after seeing me notice them and made a quick exit. Obviously, I had some trouble sleeping after this. I spent hours checking security cameras and going from room to room looking out the windows, hoping but also not hoping I would see anything that could explain what had happened. This morning, I went outside to the spot where I thought the figure would have been standing. I had hoped that maybe there was a plant or something I mistook for a person, but when I got to that spot, I realized the figure had been standing in a bare patch of ground directly in front of that window. With everything that's been happening, I can't shake the feeling that for some reason, there's somebody watching our family. I just hope I'm wrong. My name is Bree. This happened in 2016. I was 19 years old at the time. I was up late the night before into the early morning studying, and I hadn't had very much sleep. I had just woken up from a nap I'd taken to catch up, and I decided to hop in the shower to wake myself up a bit. And that's when I started to hear this weird scraping sound coming from somewhere outside. I stopped the shower and peered out from behind the curtain. I then made my way over to the window. I couldn't see anything out there, but I could still hear that scraping noise. I thought it may have been my neighbor working in a shed or something, so I ignored the disturbance and finished up my showering business before I continued. I should inform you that I have severe anxiety problems, and I often get a little bit paranoid. It doesn't help that I have a form of PTSD as well. Anyway, I was now back in my room. I took a seat on my bed and texted my boyfriend. I asked him what he wanted for dinner. While I was waiting for him to respond, I relaxed and scrolled through my Facebook. I was reading an article about the recent clown sightings that were happening at the time. That was when I was interrupted by the sound of footsteps coming from outside. I stopped and listened in carefully. I could hear more footsteps, followed by a tapping noise. I was a bit confused. It hadn't yet occurred to me that I could have an unwelcomed guest outside. I was thinking to myself, why wouldn't my boyfriend knock on the door or call before he showed up? We usually had a routine with things like this, especially if I was home alone. He would either call or FaceTime me to let me know when he was on his way. There had been a lot of shady activity around our neighborhood at the time. I called out, and suddenly all fell silent. I texted my boyfriend and asked him if that was him at the door. There was no reply. I decided to peek through the bedroom window. While I was making my way to the other side of the room, my phone started ringing. It was my boyfriend wanting to FaceTime. When I answered, he said he was 15 minutes away. As I was talking to him, I pulled back the curtains of my bedroom window, and that's when all the blood in my veins turned to ice. I found myself face to face with a clown. I knew I wasn't hallucinating. An actual clown was looking at me through the window, smiling. After my initial shock, I actually started to laugh thinking that this had to be some sort of prank my boyfriend was pulling on me. I played along pretending to be terrified and whispered in to my phone. Very funny. I love the whole scary clown thing. I chuckled and rolled my eyes. My boyfriend was very confused. 
I explained to him about the clown at the window and said that he and his friend had done a good job scaring the piss out of me again. He said that all his friends were hanging out at the pub and that he was not part of any plans to prank me. Upon hearing this, I felt my stomach in my throat. I looked back at the clown outside. He reached into his costume and pulled out a very real-looking knife. By this point, I wasn't sure what was going on. I grabbed up my baseball bat. My boyfriend told me he was now only a few minutes away and shouted at me to stay inside and lock all the doors and windows. I quickly closed the curtains and went into the lounge. It wasn't long before I heard a loud pounding at the front door. Suddenly, I heard a creepy voice coming from the other side. Let me in. I didn't respond to that voice. I stood perfectly still, waiting for their next move. The loud pounding rang out again, causing the door to rattle in its hinges, but I kept quiet even as I heard the doorknob rattling. I was pretty scared at this point, but I was also getting really irritated. Eventually, I had enough and yelled out, Hey, fuck off! Go annoy someone else! I heard a muffled laughter, followed by the creepy voice once more. Please let me in, doll. I just want to play. I want to play with your insides. I had enough of this. I was about to go outside and beat this guy's ass myself. That was when I heard my boyfriend's voice, who was still on the phone. He said to hang up and call the cops. After some consideration, I thought maybe confronting the clown outside holding a knife was not the correct course of action, so I did as my boyfriend said. I left the lounge and was soon explaining the situation to the police dispatcher. I was on my way back to my room when I heard the sound of glass breaking. I stopped in my tracks and told him I thought the guy had just broken into my house. They immediately told me to get somewhere safe. That's when I heard my boyfriend yelling out, Hey, what the hell are you doing? Get out of here! The police are on their way! The clown just billowed out a psychotic laugh. They took off. As I made my way back into the bedroom, something caught my eye. I peered out the window through a gap in the curtains and saw another clown. He appeared to be holding some sort of blade in his hand. I went to move, but I was like a deer caught in the headlights. I couldn't do anything. Fear overcame me as I realized my boyfriend was out there with these two creepy clowns. I screamed into the phone that there was another one outside my bedroom. After a few moments, I was relieved when I heard my boyfriend at the back door. I let him inside, and we held each other until the police arrived. After taking our statements, the police discovered a rusted hacksaw and an axe lying on the ground outside my bedroom window. Of course, the creepy clowns that had turned my night into a freak show were nowhere to be found. After that night, I struggled to fall asleep. I often think to myself, what would have happened to me if I had been stupid enough to open that door? Were they just a couple of thrill-seekers looking to frighten a girl who was all alone? Or were they in fact out for blood? The following happened last summer, and I haven't told anyone about it yet for some reason. I like taking late night walks, especially during the summer. One night, I decided to take an unusual route, which I would later greatly regret. It was about 11 p.m. and the sun had already gone down. It wasn't completely dark yet, though. The road I was walking was quite long, and at the end of it, I could see someone moving toward me. I didn't think much of it, obviously. When he was about 90 feet away from me, though, he suddenly started to run. His running initially resembled somebody jogging, and that's what I thought he was doing at first so I didn't really react. As he got closer, though, I could see he was wielding something in his hand. I now started to suspect something was wrong. He was finally about to run past me when he suddenly stopped right next to me and looked me in the eyes. He walked right up to me and said something that would haunt me forever from then on. Why didn't you run? I could have killed you. 
I think you should run next time. As he was standing there next to me, I could see that the object he was holding was a stick taser like the ones you'd see guards using. The man then turned around and ran away. I still wonder what would have happened if I would have trusted my instincts in that moment and started to run. My family and I had a caravan in a holiday park in NSW. We would go there every school holiday, and there were many kids I used to run around and play with. I have very fond memories of this place, where I learned to ride a bike and had my first kiss even, but other memories are not as good, and now leave me with that egg flip feeling in my stomach. The people that owned the caravan park had a son, he was roughly 25 years old. I would have been around 5 or 6 at the time. He would drive around the park and collect everyone's rubbish on a tractor and do other odd jobs to help out his parents. Every once in a while he would pull up when I was playing out front and ask if I wanted to ride on the tractor. Being young and naive, of course I accepted and jumped right on. What child doesn't want to ride a tractor? This was back in the days where parents would let their children play in the streets. Without much or any supervision, he just came back home when the street lights came on. One day, when he dropped me back to our van, my dad came storming out and grabbed me by the arm. He yanked me off the tractor. Without saying a word to the man, he took me inside and told me never ever to hang out with him again. I don't want you going around with that man, he said, without saying why. But he's nice. He gives me candy, I said. Just don't. I'm telling you, do not talk to him, he replied. I couldn't understand why my dad didn't want me talking to such a nice man, who gave me tractor rides, candy, and hugs, sometimes even the occasional sandwich. I remember just telling the man flat out one day. My dad said, I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. He gave me a sort of smirk. Oh uh, yeah? Why's that? Fast forward nearly 13 to 14 years later. My family and I were watching the news when suddenly the man's face flashed across the screen. It was attached to a story about how he'd killed multiple people and was now serving time in prison. My dad immediately caught on to this. Look at that. Look at that. I knew that guy was bad news. There was always something just off about him. You remember how he used to take you around on the tractor? My blood ran cold. My stomach dropped. The most disturbing part? He killed people with these pills he would make. That he called candies. Always listen to your parents. I would be dead by now if it weren't for them. This happened just a few hours ago. My house is on the very edge of town, just before a large wooded area. We do have some neighbors. There are around six apartments in total, and some houses across the street as well. It was around 11 p.m. though, and at that time most of them are usually asleep or sitting in front of their TV, or perhaps even both. I went to take my dog on a walk, when I noticed a bike leaning against the wall in a driveway. That seemed odd. There's a bike rack behind the house. I didn't really think much of it though, and continued on my way. When I came back, the bike was still there. Now, there are walls on both sides of the driveway, about five feet tall at the highest point just behind the gate. I looked up at the wall to my left, only to stare right into the cold, dead eyes of a woman crouching there on top of it. It scared the hell out of me. I just kind of stared back for a second. I had never seen this woman before. She didn't move whatsoever. My dog also seemed to be getting scared as well. I rushed over to my door and never took my eyes off her. Once we had gone past her, she leapt off the wall and began to follow us, 
At that point, my dog, a pretty big Doberman mix, began growling and barking furiously. Luckily, that seemed to make her change her mind and stop coming any closer. I got inside the house and locked the door behind me. I was sure as hell glad to have my big dog with me. I don't know who that woman was or what she was up to, but the scariest part is I realized that she had probably been waiting there even when I initially left. I was born, raised, and still live in Texas. I come from a family of hunters. It's pretty much a family tradition. I'm going to tell you about something I experienced when I was 20 years old, back in 2005. My father had just been diagnosed with lung cancer, and naturally everyone in my family was devastated by this, especially me. My dad and I were very close. I had a lot of other personal stuff going on in my life at the time, and I felt like I needed to go out for a few days just to clear my head a bit. I decided to make it a solo hunting trip and packed up some camping gear, along with my Marlin 336 set my dad had gifted to me when I was 18 years old. If I could get sentimental for a moment, my father ended up passing away three years after his diagnosis, and to this day I still use that very same rifle for hunting. Anyway, this happened around late October or early November. I don't want to be too specific with the location, because technically I was not supposed to be hunting in this specific area. I will disclose that it was somewhere near the Mexican border, this will be important later. I decided to set up camp for three days before heading back. I had been hunting on this land before with some friends of mine, and I knew the precautions to take not to be spotted by the game warden. I'm sure if there's any other hunters listening to this broadcast, they'll be more than happy to tell you we often wipe our asses with the rule book. Before anyone judges me too harshly or the practice of hunting in general, I will say I'm a very spiritual person and have a profound respect for Mother Nature. I don't put trash everywhere, and every part of every animal I put down never goes to waste. I'll be the first to admit there are hunters that give us a bad name, and me not following rules is more of a middle finger to the government than it is to the sport of hunting. The first day went off without a hitch. No problems whatsoever, aside from the fact there was no gain to be found anywhere. I figured I would head further south the next day, to see if my luck would improve any. Other hunters knew about this restricted location, and may have already cleaned out this area. As night fell, I found myself sprawled out next to my truck, staring at the night sky. I wondered if my dad and I would ever take another hunting trip together. That's when I heard the sound of footsteps slowly making their way through a nearby brush. This was alarming for obvious reasons. Whoever this was, they had the drop on me. I knew better than to light up a campfire under these circumstances, but if this person was roaming around in the dark without a flashlight, they may have had some kind of night vision apparatus, giving them the advantage. I was very concerned. If you were looking at me through the trees in that particular moment, it would have appeared as though I was sleeping. I was in an odd position where I was resting on top of my sleeping bag with a blanket because I felt claustrophobic being fully immersed in a sleeping bag. This happened to be a good thing because it meant I was able to mobilize myself quickly. Something told me I only had seconds to make a decision. I rolled sideways out of instinct and as soon as I did so, I caught a glimpse of a muzzle flash coming from the tree line directly in front of me. I felt dirt fly in the air and hit my back from a bullet striking the ground where I had just been. I scrambled to my feet as more shots rang out from the trees. One of them shattered the passenger side window of my truck. I took cover behind the bed of my pickup and quickly drew the snub nose I had strapped to my ankle. After the gunfire ended, 
I laid down flat on the ground and returned fire in the direction of the trees from under the truck. I heard several sets of footsteps fleeing the area, but I held my position just in case my theory about night vision was correct. With only two rounds left in my revolver, I pretty much spent the rest of that night underneath my truck, pistol aimed at the darkness. I waited there until the sun came out and illuminated my surroundings. I very cautiously got out from beneath my vehicle and packed up my gear as quickly as I could. I hightailed it out of there. Later on, when I told a friend of mine about the incident, he said he wished I would have told him I was heading out that way. He said he would have warned me. The Mexican cartel had started using that area to smuggle contraband and people across the nearby border. This friend of mine was an immigrant from Mexico himself and had several family members mixed up in the cartel and coyote groups. Needless to say, I trusted his word. All things considered, I think I got off pretty easy. Had I been in my sleeping bag that night, no doubt that bullet would have nailed me. These days, I stick to designated hunting grounds. Some things are just not worth the risk. Okay, so buckle up because this is going to get weird. This isn't something unknown amongst my friends and the people local to me, as I live in quite a small town. In grade 5, I would have been about 13 or 14, and I had no friends. I was and still am kind of weird, and it tended to throw people off. Making friends in high school was so difficult for me, because I refused to change who I was just to fit in. During the second week of school, I met George in my English class. Our teacher had sat us together, and we had begun talking and building a friendship. George seemed very nice, and we had a lot in common as well. He had come from a different elementary school. It was odd because people from his area commonly went to a different high school although he insisted he wanted to go to this one because there were certain classes he wanted to take that the other school didn't offer. After about a week of talking together during English, he asked if I wanted to eat lunch with him. We had the same lunch period and he said he noticed how often I sat alone. I thought it was the nicest gesture, so I agreed. We ended up having lunch together for a while, but then I started making some new friends. I always invited him to eat lunch with a few of the friends I had made, but he always declined. Then, one day in English, he passed me a note. This was very strange since we were sitting right next to each other. It said something like, I need to talk to you. Can we please sit alone together for lunch? I wrote back I would sit down with him, and we hardly spoke for the rest of the period. I started getting really weird vibes from him. So, lunchtime rolled around. I saw him sitting at the end of a row. I go to sit down and he says, No, let's go outside to talk. I agreed. He looked really upset. I wanted to know what was going on. When we got outside, he led me over to sit on a curb in front of the school and started talking very aggressively. He told me it was unfair of me to make other friends when he was the one who'd befriended me first. He told me I had to eat lunch with him because when I was alone, he ate lunch with me. Now that he was alone, I was obligated to do the same. It was a very bizarre conversation. I explained that he could sit with me and my friends, and that way there would be no issues. He could even make some new friends himself. I had enough friendship to spread around, and he had nothing to be upset about. What he said next completely shocked me. I could see the anger in his eyes. He grabbed my arm real hard. I don't think you understand. You owe me this. You will sit with me. I got freaked out at that point and told him we could sit alone together every other day. I just wanted to get away from him and go back inside where more people were around. After that day, I started getting these weird messages in my email. I'll never forget the first one. All it said was, All women are Satan. The devil lives in all of you. I didn't recognize the address and assumed it was some internet troll trying to scare me. 
Then they started coming more frequently, all with the same type of message. I started getting scared, so I showed my friends these emails. They agreed that it was weird, but also agreed it was probably some random person just trying to scare people. One of my friends, though, told me that she thought it was George. She had heard some stories about why he'd come to our school instead of going to the other one. She told me he was so obsessed with one of the girls in his class that her mom had to get a restraining order against him over the summer. I told her that sounded insane, and I didn't believe it. I was having lunch with George on alternate days, and we were still friendly during English class, but I was trying to distance myself from him. After Christmas break, our schedules changed for second semester. I was very happy about this, because I knew I'd have a different lunch period and we wouldn't have English together anymore. I could slowly disassociate myself from him. I was wrong. He started leaving notes in my locker, confessing his undying love, and explaining that we were meant to take over the world together. The feelings were very much not mutual. I had to tell him that enough was enough. I explained he was overwhelming me, and I needed space from our friendship. He seemed to understand. He didn't get upset or yell. He just agreed to give me my space. In the meantime, the emails started getting much worse. They started threatening my life, telling me they knew where I lived and went to school. I went straight to my mom when this started happening. My mom called the police. The police informed the school. The school looked at the email in their records and found out it was indeed George sending those emails all along. He was suspended and wouldn't even look at me after. I was honestly so relieved. One year after we graduated high school, George and his mother went out for a drive. While she was driving, he stabbed her over 100 times. When the police found him, he tried saying it was a car accident, but when they questioned him further about all the stab wounds, he admitted to killing her. He claimed he was trying to release the devil from his mother's soul. He pleaded insanity and was found not criminally responsible for her murder. I work at a gas station in the center of my town. My shifts aren't always the same, but I find myself often on overnights and early mornings most of the time. I'd been there for a whole year at this point, and honestly, I didn't really have many negative things to say about it. It was a perfectly normal, middle-paying job that only required me to stand in one spot for eight hours and talk to the occasional customer. On this day, I was working an overnight shift, the typical 10 to 6. Although it's usually not too busy overnight on the weekdays, it's worth mentioning that it was raining a decent amount this night, so I was really expecting it to be a quiet night. The first couple of hours, I sat at a chair behind the register and just waited for anyone to come in. I got a few people that paid for gas with cash, but by 12.30 or 1ish, it was basically dead. There were no customers coming inside, and barely anyone even getting gas outside now. With absolutely no customers to be seen, I went around the counter and started fixing up the shelves a bit. They weren't too bad, but it was just something to keep myself busy. As I was doing this, I had my back facing the windows. That's when I noticed a headlights glare through the store someone pulled in to the pumping stations. I didn't even bother to look. There was nothing interesting about a guy pulling in to get some gas or whatever. I kept on tidying up the shelves for maybe 10 or so minutes before I unconsciously glanced out the window. The car was still there by one of the pumps with a man standing right next to it. As soon as I looked over, the man shifted away making it obvious he had been looking at me. After seeing that, I felt a bit weirded out, especially since they'd been there supposedly pumping gas for a whole 10 minutes. I went back to the counter, then checked out the window again 30 seconds later. 
I could see the man getting into his car. The headlights flashed a few times, like he was trying and failing to turn it on. Eventually, he got it running and drove away in a real hurry. I stood there and just kind of looked out the window for a minute. Something really didn't seem right about this. I got an idea and pulled up the recent transactions for the pump he was at. The last time it was used was hours ago. He had been there for ten whole minutes, not even pumping gas, doing nothing other than watching me through the window. I stayed behind the counter for a while, just trying to wait out the rest of my shift. A few more cars came and went, and then it got really quiet again. Around 3 o'clock, I heard something happening outside. The rain was really heavy at this point, but there was a rhythmic shuffling noise on the ground that was barely audible through it. It sounded like the footsteps of someone sneaking along the side of the building, moving toward the back area. I tried to look out the window, but there was not a good view. I did notice that no cars were in the parking lot or by the pumps, though. I quickly left the counter and went to the back door. It was a heavy metal door that had no windows or anything on it. I pressed my ear up against it and listened as the footsteps got closer and closer until they were right on the other side of that door. My eyes moved to the handle, waiting in silence, before the handle turned slowly and slightly. It got caught by the lock and it went quiet again. Almost a whole minute passed by when I heard a man's voice grunt in frustration. A sharp sound slid across the other side of the door. Footsteps followed soon after, leaving back and going around the side of the gas station. I ran back to the front, waiting to see the person walking away, but I didn't catch any sign of them. Acting quickly, I picked up the store phone and dialed 911 hoping to catch them before they got too far away. I couldn't see exactly what was happening outside, but I did know that someone had just been trying to get in through the back door, and they must have been intending on doing something bad. When the cops arrived, they didn't find the man, but what they did find was a car on the side of the road, less than a fourth of the mile away. It was the very same car I'd seen earlier, with the man who had been watching me in it. It had run out of gas, it had mismatching license plates, and turned out to be some guy's missing car from two states over. The other thing they noted was a long scrape across the back door, made by a sharp metal object, most likely a knife or blade of some sort. Knowing all these details, I think I actually got extremely lucky. The man was probably on the run already if he'd stolen someone's vehicle, and he could have been planning anything. This happened about 11 years ago, back when I'd just broken up with a girlfriend of mine. Let's call her Y. About a week after our breakup, I started to get these strange texts from an unknown number. Let me just sum up the very first message they sent me. Hi, this is T. I'm someone that works with Y. I've heard that you've dated her before, and I'm quite infatuated with her. I'm wondering if maybe you could give me some advice or something? My first reaction was, what the hell? Who the hell does that? Why would this guy even know my number or about my relationship at all? And why text me randomly with such a creepy vibe? It was actually a bit longer than my summary. It was much more in-depth about his love for my recent ex. I thought about just ignoring it, but by that point I had a couple beers on board, so I decided to reply. Honestly, I found it kind of funny in a way. I said something like, I haven't been in touch with Y, but you know that this might not be the best timing. Still, if you like her that much, I guess it's up to you. Let her know however you want to. I got a reply about an hour later. Thank you, thank you very much for your encouragement. I'm so grateful. I'll do my best. As you might have guessed, I didn't reply to that one. From then on, I got a text from this random guy every single day. 
It was always so cringy as well. Thank you so much for your words of encouragement. They really give me the strength and courage I need to step up. I didn't reply to any of these sorts of texts, obviously, but this guy would text me even if I never replied. It was always telling me this ongoing story. I summoned the strength to speak to her at work today. We had a big talk. It was really great. Another one came through after. She bumped into me on the way to work. It was so great, my friend. We talked about all sorts of stuff besides work. I didn't really need to know all this stuff, and this guy just sounded kind of weird. There was something strange about the way he was phrasing these things. Again, I didn't reply. I can't lie, it was sort of intriguing for a while to get daily reports of some random guy's life. It was around this point when the context of these texts changed abruptly, though. Why doesn't Y notice how I feel about her? She must have loads of boyfriends or guy friends or whatever. So why does she never pay attention to me? Why do they always laugh at me when I try to speak to her? God, I hate girls with loads of male friends. Shit, I thought. What have I gotten myself into? I should have told this guy to leave me alone ages ago. Before I could even think of what to do, he sent me another text. I just thought of a great idea, my friend. I'm gonna get some guys together and have them attack her on the way home from work tonight. And then I'll jump in and save her. That'll really get her attention on me won't it? The way me and Y ended things was bad, don't get me wrong, but that still didn't mean I wanted some weird guy to stalk and obsess about her or get some people to fucking attack her. I had to let her know what was going on. I sent her a text and explained everything about her co-worker's plans for her after the night shift, about everything else he'd said too. I even offered to come pick her up and take her home. A reply was unexpected to say the least. The guy you're talking about doesn't work here. I don't have any male co-workers. The only male co-worker I have is the owner of the store. Hey, don't worry about it. I'm leaving with some friends tonight and there are some police nearby anyway, so I'm sure it'll be fine. It was quite a relieving message, if not a bit cold. I was glad she would be safe. But the guy who was emailing me was genuinely making my skin crawl now. If he didn't even work with her, how did he know all this stuff about me and her? I sent him a text. Hey, look you creep, I told Y about your little plan, so don't lay a finger on her, got it? He didn't reply. When it started to get dark outside, I started to get a bit twitchy. I was thinking of my ex working the night shift. I was also thinking of that weird guy. I was worried that something bad was going to happen. I checked my phone over and over to see if he'd replied, but the rain had started to fall. It soon passed 11pm, his proposed time of attack when she was supposed to be getting off work. My phone was still silent, nothing from him or my ex. I began to relax when suddenly I got a call from my ex. I answered it immediately. She was crying and in a panic. Whoa, whoa, what's going on? I'm on my way home and I'm by the station. A guy has been following me the whole time. Now I was in a panic too. I'm too scared to look behind me. The line then abruptly cut. My doorbell rang. My heart was racing. I ran to the peephole. It was my ex at the door. I quickly opened it and let her in. She lived around the same area as me, so I guess that's why she immediately came to my house. She was as white as a ghost and was crying, covered in rainwater. She told me to lock the door immediately. Did the person following you see you go into my apartment? I asked. I don't know, I guess so, maybe. He was right behind me when I got here. I ran out to my balcony and looked outside. There was no sign of anyone out there. I grabbed my phone and called T's number. They picked up right away. I'm calling the police. I have all the proof I need to show them. If you try anything stupid tonight, you'll regret it. I couldn't hear a single word in response. Just the sound of the rain crashing down in the background and heavy breathing on the other end. 
Then the line cut. I knew that he must be out there somewhere in the rain. I know I should have contacted the police sooner, but when you're so young, it's the last thing you want to do. I was also a bit of a dick and troublemaker when I was that age, so I was scared of getting in trouble with the police. I sat with Y and kept her company all night. I convinced her to go to work the next day and to be ready to go to the police if anything strange happened. We shot nervous glances at the door all night while the rain lashed at the windows. I was expecting to hear something outside or the doorbell ringing at any moment, but thankfully the whole night passed by without further incident. The next day, I got a huge text. It went something like this. I'm truly sorry. I don't actually work with your ex. I went to her shop and saw her there and fell in love at first sight. A couple days later, I was at a local restaurant, and I saw her there with her friends. They were talking about that recent breakup you guys had. She didn't seem to be very phased by it. They were all drinking, and they got up to go to the bathroom, so I took my chance. I went over, and I went into her phone, and I grabbed your number. I'm sorry for everything I did. After this weird confession, nothing happened. I didn't hear from T again nor did Y either. I don't know the guy's true identity or even what he looked like, so I couldn't do anything about him. I couldn't report him. I couldn't warn anybody about his behavior for the future. All I could do was give the number to the police. I did, of course, but nothing came of it. This didn't impact me as much as it did Y, but so far, it's the creepiest thing that's ever happened to me. So, to T, on behalf of myself and Y, I hope we never interact with each other again. I work as a mechanic for a car shop in my town. It's a locally owned and run repair place that started up many years ago. The shop runs out of an old warehouse and has a bunch of broken down cars and pieces of cars sitting outside. They're stored in what we refer to as the scrap yard. That's just the name we give it though. Most of the scrap yard is cars waiting for parts to arrive. Anyway, my job for the past two years has been to order and keep track of stock that goes in and out. The best time to do this is when it's not busy. So, overnight, I guess. I kind of doubled as a security guard, too, because it wasn't uncommon for crazy people or teenagers to jump the fence and try to mess with or steal stuff from the scrapyard. On this night, I got into work at 8 o'clock. I talked to my boss for a bit before he left for the night, and then it was just me in the warehouse, all alone. It was raining outside, so inside the building it was really noisy. It was also calming in a way though. I did my usual routine of going through the orders that the mechanics had sent in and checking what had been used during the day. There was nothing out of the ordinary, but two cars needed to order very specific parts, and for one of them, the mechanic didn't write down the model year. Sometimes that can be really important. I got up from the desk and walked through the warehouse, looking for this gray Nissan Versa so I could confirm what part I needed to obtain. As I got to the end of the warehouse, though, I still couldn't find it anywhere. I sighed, knowing it had to be somewhere in the scrapyard, which of course was on the one day it happened to be raining out. I went back to my desk and after a brief coffee break, I grabbed my jacket and flashlight and went to the back door. The rain seemed to have really picked up since I was last outside. In the distance, I could immediately see the car I was looking for, hiding between a few other vehicles. I stepped out into the rain and started walking over, turning on my flashlight. As I got about to the center of the scrapyard, though, a sudden movement of something in front of me made me stop in my tracks. It was just at the edge of my light. I wasn't able to see much, but it looked like a person 
hiding behind one of the cars and moving around. The rain covered up any sound I may have heard, so all I could tell was this brief glance. I stood there and held my flashlight, waiting to see any more movement. I called out to them, Hello! I saw you just move, so get out of here already. I was hoping it was just some kid messing around. I took a few steps closer to where I'd seen them and yelled again for them to leave the property. I didn't see anything moving. I moved closer and started to look around the whole area. I figured that whoever it was must have left at my warning. Honestly, I was a bit relieved I didn't have to call the cops or do anything drastic. I quickly walked over to the Nissan and wrote down the model year, then jogged back to the warehouse and went inside. I took off my jacket and sat back at the desk, filling out the rest of the info and sending through the order. I was there for another half hour, filling out more of those order requests. Once I finished with that, I had to do the stock counting and the actual warehouse part of the building. By then, it was probably 1am or so. I walked along the shelves and checked what everyday products and parts had been used up. While making my way down the first set of shelves, though, a sudden loud thud rang through the warehouse. Then the lights went out. I stood there with my eyes wide open, staring into the dark abyss around me. I couldn't see anything, but between the sound of the rain hitting the roof, I could hear footsteps walking through the building. I stared in the direction of where this sound was coming from, and I could immediately tell that whoever this was, they were coming right for me. I didn't know what to do at this point. I was sure that whoever was in here had shut the power off, but why were they here in the first place? I didn't know, and without light, I couldn't even run away. All I could do was listen to the footsteps grow louder as I stared into the pitch black. I hoped they didn't know exactly where I was. They were only about 10 feet away when I heard them stop. After a moment, I heard a box open and things being shifted around. The footsteps then began going away again. I was holding my breath the whole time. After 30 seconds, it was completely silent. I waited for a few minutes before finally taking my phone out and calling 911. I then used the flashlight on it to move toward the breaker room. I found the switch flipped off and switched the power back on. Looking through the warehouse with the police, all that had been left were wet shoe prints going throughout the building and out the back door. It seemed like the person that had been out in the scrapyard had slipped in while I was outside. The door was still unlocked. Then they obviously stole a bunch of gear. Even though they didn't have the intent to hurt me likely, who knows what could have happened if they knew I was standing only a few feet away from them. Without me ever getting a good look at them, there's no telling if they came armed and willing to do anything. This happened when I was in school. It was summer break. I always loved going to see my cousins during the time off from school. My family and I always went to visit them as they only lived in the next city over. I was really looking forward to seeing my cousin. He was a little bit older than me, but he was always up for playing fun games with me. Unfortunately, he was not around this time, so I had to play alone. I didn't mind playing alone since my cousin's house backed onto a forest with a small mountain. It was really great there. Always fun to be had, looking for bugs or exploring the area. I decided to go exploring on this day. I really wanted to go to the top of the mountain all by myself, so I set my sights on that summit and started marching uphill. Along the way, though, I noticed a curious dirt path leading off to the side. I was curious to see what might be here. I noticed there was an abandoned-looking house somewhere further down this path. Well, I thought this would be an awesome place to make a base. My cousin would love it too, so I decided to get a bit closer and check it out further. 
I was so excited that I had found this place. I crept up close to the exterior of this house and peeked in through a broken window to see what was inside. I saw something so weird it will stay with me for the rest of my life. It was all decayed in there, of course, but there was one single chair that looked brand new, and in front of that chair were these life-sized cutouts of various famous people. The way they had been placed made me think someone had to have deliberately set them up around the chair like an audience or something. There was a baseball player cut out, an anime one, an actress. The way they were all positioned around this single chair was as if they were in conversation with each other and someone else. It looked as though whoever was in the chair wanted to be the center of attention. The house itself was a mess. Broken glass, the walls were all chipped and damaged, yet this chair and these cutouts were brand new. Needless to say, this discovery was off-putting and more than a little bit creepy. My gut told me that something was off about this, so I decided to get back to my cousin's house. As I was getting ready to leave, my skin went cold despite the hot summer day. Something innate inside me was telling me I had to get out of here right now. I began to scramble back up toward the mountain path. And that's when I noticed something I hadn't before. I had gotten a bit up the dirt road, and I had a more aerial view of the cardboard cutouts in the house. One of them really stood out to me. It seemed to be moving by itself for some reason. I didn't run as I was fascinated by what I was seeing. I stood there watching it, and cold sweat began amassing on my brow. I was beginning to realize what I was witnessing. I looked closer, and my heart paused for a moment when I saw a man hiding behind one of the cutouts in the corner. I could see his arms and legs, but not his face. As soon as I figured out there was a man there, I ran as fast as I could back to my cousin's house. Because I was young and didn't quite understand what had happened or if I would be in trouble, I kept the incident to myself. If I hadn't noticed a man had been there, or if my gut instinct was off that day, I might have gone back to that house at a later point by myself again, and who knows if I'd be alive to tell this story. Now that I'm a bit older, I've had some time to think about how strange that situation was. What was the purpose of those cutouts? Were they there to lure people in? Did the man tell naive people or children they could meet celebrities or something? If someone went into that house in the middle of those woods, then what would he have done to them? I still think about it from time to time. I worked for a packaging company at the central office, along with owner's eldest daughters who helped to run the company. I had worked there for over a year, and I really loved my job really nice people to work for. Things all changed, though, when a temp went in for his interview. I'll call him C. I would assist my manager with the interviews by sitting in and taking notes. When C walked in the interview room, my manager shook his hand and greeted him. As he was greeting her back, though, he kept staring at only me, which I found a bit odd. We said a quick hello slash greeting as well and the interview started. C got the job and was shown around the office and would be starting the next day. The following day, work started off like always. Busy, but in a good way. Nothing too hectic that I couldn't handle. C came into the office and I, along with a co-worker, showed him the inventory he'd be helping to care for and introduced him to the rest of the crew and people he would be working with. We showed him the computer system, gave him instructions on how to do what he needed to do. Everything was going pretty well. He was polite, got straight to work, and my co-worker and I went back to our areas. I felt like kind of a jerk for feeling the way I did the day before when I'd initially met him. At the end of the day, heading to my car... I was surprised to see C standing right next to it. I asked him if he needed something. 
He told me he wanted to apologize for the day before. All the staring. He didn't mean to be rude. I told him it was fine. No harm, no foul. He asked if he could make it up to me by taking me out to lunch tomorrow. I told him that although I did appreciate the offer, he didn't have to make up anything to me. Plus, since I was always busy at work, I normally eat at my desk anyway. That wasn't true, but the excuse seemed to work on him. A couple of weeks later, my co-worker H, who I'm also good friends with, asked me what exactly was going on between C and I. I was confused as to what she was talking about. She told me that C was spreading all these rumors about me, that we were romantically involved and there was a lot of chemistry between us. Now I was really confused and freaked out. I didn't see how he could mistake me giving him the inventory list as flirting, seeing as how we barely even talked otherwise. That same day, apparently he became aware I knew what he was saying. That day, I had to leave early, since I was going to watch my young niece who was sick, while my sister went to work. I was already stressed out about my sick niece, so I decided to put off dealing with him to the next day. About two hours after I got home, I was alone with my five-year-old niece, when suddenly I heard the doorbell ring. I peeked out the window, only to see that C was outside. I told my niece to go lock herself in the bedroom and hide just in case. I opened the front door, the security door beyond that still being locked, and I proceeded to flip out on him. What made him think it was okay to show up to my home unannounced? He started telling me he wanted to explain himself. As he started telling me his BS story, I asked him how he even knew my address in the first place. He then got real quiet and really serious. He told me he was on his way home when he passed by my house and recognized my car. I called out his BS. My sister had taken my car since hers had a booster seat and since I needed to help organize his employee file, I knew he didn't live anywhere near me at all. I told him he needed to leave right now. He started raising his voice, telling me I was hurting his feelings because I couldn't see how much he liked me and how stupid I was to not see what a great catch he is. As he was insisting on talking to me, my brother-in-law pulled up into the driveway. Now, he was a big guy. Although he has a teddy bear heart, he can be very intimidating. C turned around and saw him there, and I could just see the color drain from his face immediately. He told C to scram, and I'd never seen someone take off that fast. I called my manager and told her what just happened. She told me not to worry. She'd tell the temp agency he was no longer allowed at my work. I didn't see him anywhere after that day. Two days later, I got called into my manager's office. Apparently, she'd had a weird feeling when I called her and decided to review the security cameras. Turns out that on the day he was interviewed, he stayed outside the premises. He waited for about six hours, and he finally left after I was leaving for the day. That explains how he knew which vehicle was mine. He most likely followed me, and that's how he knew where I lived as well. For the past couple of years, I've had the same job. I'm a janitor for a popular fast food restaurant. I don't take orders or do anything at all aside from cleaning. I don't even see the other workers a lot of the time because I'm scheduled overnight. At the restaurant, everything needs to be deep cleaned every day. And during open hours, it's basically impossible to do so. I've never had anything happen during my shifts, aside from the occasional customer knocking on the window and asking if we're open. On this night, I came in and got to work like I usually did. A couple other employees were still there when I got there, but by 10 o'clock, which was about an hour after closing, it was just me for the rest of the night. I popped in my headphones and started scraping the grills and prepping everything that needed to be hosed down. After a while, I kind of lost track of time. My best guess is that it was sometime around 12 a.m. 
That's when I heard a knock at the front of the building. I pulled off my headphones and heard it once more. I walked over to the front, expecting someone at the door, checking to see if we were closed or not. But once I got over there and looked outward, nobody was there. I went up to the door and observed the parking lot as well. No cars or people to be seen. I knew I'd heard it from this side of the building, though. I waited to hear the sound again, but there was nothing. I ended up thinking that maybe I mistook another sound for knocking. I went back to doing my work. Another hour or so went by. I took a lunch break and grabbed my lunch bag. I sat down at one of the tables in the middle of the dining area. I was taking my time, since I was actually a bit ahead on my cleaning schedule. Once I finished eating, I went to the back and turned to grab the mop, only to see a man's face staring at me from outside the drive through window. He had messy hair and a blank expression, but his eyes, his eyes had something strange about them. It was like they were completely empty. I froze up for a second, and after a moment, the man calmly turned and walked away. My heart was racing in my chest from surprise. I just stood there, listening to his departing footsteps into the darkness. I didn't exactly know what to think about this. It was just incredibly creepy and strange. Once I got my confidence back, I opened the window and looked outward to make sure he'd actually left. It was dark beyond the light of the restaurant, but I didn't see anyone. I closed it up and locked it. I was on edge for the next hour or so, constantly looking behind me at the windows, feeling like I was being watched from somewhere. As my shift was coming to an end, I started to finally feel some relief. The anxiety calmed down. One of the last few things I had to do was roll all the garbage bags out to the dumpster, which I had been avoiding doing for as long as I could. I checked out the window again before I stepped out. It looked clear. I quickly opened the door and tossed the garbage out. I started tossing them in one by one into the dumpster. Not even 20 seconds into this though, the man suddenly appeared from just around the corner. I stopped what I was doing and quickly called out to ask the man what he needed. He didn't respond at all. He simply kept walking toward me. He had that same empty stare. Now I could see his whole body though, and it was even more terrifying. He was an extremely large man, wearing a dirty and stained coat. Not knowing what else to do, I ran for the door and opened it. The man's footsteps rushed up behind me. As I slammed the door shut, the man stuck out his arm into the gap and prevented me from closing it. I turned and sprinted to the other end of the restaurant, getting my keys out and unlocking the front door as fast as I could. I heard the man closing the distance behind me. I barely got away again. I ran just as he was about to grab me. I sprinted across the parking lot as far as I could while calling the police. Five minutes later, the police arrived. The man was long gone. We had the footage on the CCTV, but no identity could be made from it. It also showed that as soon as I ran away, the man just stood there and watched me for a bit, then left at the back door. What he wanted from me is unknown, but his creepy and objectively horrifying behavior gives me chills just thinking about it. I remember it was raining quite heavily the day this happened. I went shopping with my sister in the morning. We lived together in an apartment at the time. The weather had been good in the morning. The sun was really shining, so I put some of our laundry out to dry in the garden. By lunchtime, though, the torrential rain had set in. It was a real downpour. We'd driven to an inside moor far from our apartment, there was no way we'd get back in time before the laundry was completely drenched. We just gave up on it. I mean, even if we rushed and there was no traffic, the laundry would still be saturated. Just couldn't be helped, I suppose. Later when we returned home, the whole apartment was turned upside down. 
At first, I thought maybe an earthquake had occurred, but things like the dresser, wardrobes, and the desk weren't down on the ground. It became quite evident that someone had been inside our apartment, and someone had gone through all of our belongings. Needless to say, this was extremely unnerving. We called the police immediately. Before long, a police officer arrived. He looked over the place and took some notes. He asked us what we thought was missing. We had been so shocked that we hadn't performed a complete check yet. My sister and I looked in our respective rooms. All our valuables were still lying in plain sight on our dresser. That was really strange. I was searching through my own drawers when I discovered that some of my underwear was missing. My sister rushed into my bedroom to tell me that hers was as well. I didn't really care about mine. They weren't anything too special. But my sister was very upset. She liked to buy expensive lingerie. The policeman told us that the thief must have gotten in through the garden. They found a broken window on our back door. That's how he must have gained access. The officer said that because our laundry was still outside in the rain, the thief must have guessed the apartment was empty. The officer really creeped me out by saying that the thief almost certainly knew that two women lived there. All of the objects he'd chosen to take were based on us being women. He said the thief may have even watched us leave. That really gave me the creeps. All the times I dried my underwear outside, this person must have been watching. Maybe some had even gone missing before without us even noticing. God knows how long he'd been observing us for. The officer assured us he would try his best to track down this phantom thief. He said if he caught the guy, we would be the first to know. I thanked him, but I knew it would be difficult to track this guy down. We set about cleaning up the room. It felt so gross, knowing that someone was in our house, trashing it while looking solely for our underwear. We consoled ourselves with the fact that none of our expensive possessions were missing at least. After a couple of months, life seemingly went back to normal. That is, until one day... I got a call from the police station. It appeared the thief may have been caught. This guy had done this multiple times apparently, and they'd finally nabbed him. The police said they'd recovered our possessions as well, and asked us to come down to the station to retrieve them. I asked my sister to come along with me. To be honest, we didn't have much interest in getting our undergarments back. We wanted to go just in case the thief had taken something important we didn't know about. When we got there, the policeman who called led us to separate rooms. There was an absolutely massive pile of underwear on the table. It was so creepy. The policeman pointed us to some specific ones off to the side and said, Is this yours? How the hell did this guy know which ones were ours? I then thought, Oh god, is this guy the criminal? Was this the guy who was in our apartment? As these dark thoughts danced across my mind, the policeman stared at me, waiting for my response. I couldn't say a word. I was so frightened. The perpetrator also took some photos of you and your sister. We uh, found them in a sealed bag with some of your underwear. Me and my sister took our underwear but threw them away. I mean, I guess we could have kept them and cleaned them. But having known that that man touched them, and what he must have thought about while doing so, really made my skin crawl. It was so creepy, so sinister. We never actually even got to take a look at the guy who'd broken in and stolen our things, or taken photos of us. That was what made me the most scared. I hope we never have to interact with that guy again. I had just gotten home from work and was sitting back on the couch with a movie on. It was storming outside and it was Friday, so what better to do than stay up late and watch some TV? I had the window curtains open in case any lightning started up. I was hoping to catch some cool sights outside. It doesn't really rain very often where I live, so nights like these are really rare. 
and they always get me so excited. As the night went on, just at about midnight, I noticed something strange outside my window, just down the street. There was a man walking down the sidewalk. He had no hood or coat on and was completely soaked. He walked up to one of the houses and onto their porch. I couldn't see too much through the rain. It was quite dark as well. It looked like he was waiting for them to answer the door though. After about a minute, he walked down the sidewalk again and continued further down the street. I couldn't see any further from where I was, but seeing this man's actions gave me an uneasy feeling. At this time of night and in this kind of inclement weather, it just wasn't normal to be walking around and up to people's houses. I closed the curtains by the window, just so that if he came to my house later, he wouldn't see me inside. Only about 15 minutes passed by before there was a sound outside my house. I could hear someone walking up my driveway and right up to my front door. There was no knock or doorbell ring though. I heard them moving around, walking across my porch and then back down to one of the windows, then going back to the door. By now, I was really confused. I wanted to look out the peephole, but I was worried they'd somehow notice my presence. I waited, and after a minute, there were no more sounds. I quietly walked up to the door and looked out. It was the man I'd seen earlier. He was just standing there, completely still at the edge of my porch, looking at my door with a blank expression. I watched him for a few seconds before I got really creeped out and backed away. It was now that I started to think that calling the police might be worth it, especially if he was going around to other people's houses and doing the same thing. I turned to get my phone, but just as I did so, I heard the sound of footsteps departing. I looked out again. The man was gone. After giving it some further thought, I still felt this was just too creepy to not inform the police. Whatever this man was doing, it was something that was not normal. I called them and let them know about it. They said they would send an officer out to patrol the neighborhood and see if they could get the man to stop or explain what he was doing. That was about all that could be done at the time though. I thanked them and hung up. I checked out the door one more time before going out to the couch. The whole thing had really worn me out. It was taking away the relaxing part of my relaxing night and just making me exhausted. I shut everything off and went downstairs to get in bed. As soon as I got in and turned off the lights, a loud thump sounded from downstairs. I sat up and the sound came again. It was loud, like someone smashing something against the wall. I got up and ran to the top of the stairs. Now hearing it for the third time, I realized it was the front door. Someone was bashing something against it, like they were trying to forcefully break it down. I walked down a few steps and peeked over, seeing the door violently shaking every time they hit it. It looked like they were just a few hits away from breaking it down. Now absolutely terrified, I locked myself in the bedroom and called the police again. The operator said that an officer was in the neighborhood and would be here in just a minute. Through the sound of their voice though, I heard the wood shattering and the door slamming against the ground. Footsteps quickly moved throughout the downstairs, going into every room without stopping. They began moving up the stairs but were cut off from their advance by the officer pulling in and running up to the house. The intruder immediately turned around and ran for the back door. As the officer came in, he yelled at him to get down. Apparently, they had trouble getting the back door open. The officer was able to rush him and get him down into the car. The man looked like a psycho up close and refused to say anything, not even a single word. His intentions were clear though. He was carrying a heavy hammer and had a bunch of zip ties in his pocket. And that doesn't exactly sound like a coincidence. Considering what he was doing, why did he choose to go for my house? That isn't clear. Though what likely saved me was calling the police that first time. 
If I hadn't, the officer wouldn't have already been in the neighborhood and so close by. He likely would have gotten there far too late to save me or for me to have ever been seen alive again. So this happened during summer vacation. When I was at school back then, there was an old abandoned hotel in our neighborhood. I invited two of my close friends to go urban exploring in the hotel one day. Let's call my friends A and B. We first tried the front door, but of course it was locked. We went around the back though and found an open doorway. It wasn't like we were on a dare or a ghost hunting or anything like that. It just felt like a good day for some exploring, and we all just so happened to be free. As you might expect, the place was pretty trashed up. We started in the lobby, looking around for anything interesting. Most of the rooms we found were locked, but we found a room on the fourth floor which happened to be open. We decided to make base there in that room. The smell of dust and mold wasn't that overpowering there. The bed was pretty gross, though. We pulled some chairs in from the lobby. Night crept in, and since there wasn't any electricity, we called it a night. The next day, we came back more prepared. We all brought flashlights and various other tools. We headed into the hotel around lunchtime. We brought candles, snacks, and drinks, too. We put all the stuff in our base room on the fourth floor and decided to check out the basement. We hadn't done so the day before. The three of us descended into the darkness with our flashlights in hand. The basement was huge. There were lots of rooms down there too. We were looking for a rope or something we could use to hold on to to make sure we all stayed together and didn't get lost in this huge space. It was so dark down there. I almost felt trapped. Even though it was lunchtime and during the summer, it was a very creepy feeling. My friends still seemed to feel pretty carefree though, so I tried my best to hide my growing apprehension. We then found another room within this large room. Inside of that room was a box, and in that box were a set of keys. We left the basement with that box of keys to see if they would work on any of the locked doors upstairs. The keys had room numbers on them, but they didn't seem to work on the doors that matched the numbers on the keys. We couldn't work out what these things were for. Maybe there was some auto lock in place which was why they weren't opening. We were just glad that room on the fourth floor happened to be open. We decided to look for a key which didn't appear to be a guest room key. We found one that said waiting room, written in pen. It was different from all the other keys and didn't look official for lack of a better word. While we were down in the basement, we'd noticed a locked door down there with a paper sign that said waiting room. So we decided to head back down and try that key in the lock. The door to the room unlocked immediately. When we opened it just a crack, we were confronted by a terrible stench. We asked one another about what that smell could be. Was it something rotten? Something dead? I was really freaked out, now down there in this dark basement with this terrible smell. Come on guys, let's go back, I said. Come on, don't you want to explore some more? One of my friends asked. No, man, this is too dangerous. Let's get out of here. Ah, come on, just hold your nose. We'll take a quick peek. One of my friends carelessly pushed the door open all the way and shined his flashlight inside. The light revealed a mannequin in the center with what looked like clothes soaked in blood. There were dead animals all over the room and knives had been stabbed into the mannequin in various places. Our flashlight scanned the room to reveal numerous scratches in the walls and on the door. I felt my blood turn cold. I couldn't stand to be here anymore. I ran and my friends ran out with me. We ran out through the lobby and out the back door and continued running up the street for about a hundred meters. 
We were all clamoring, screaming, and going crazy about what we had just witnessed. Why were there so many dead animals in there? Why was there a mannequin soaked in blood? We just couldn't figure it out. We all went home. I couldn't leave the house for three days. I was so freaked out by what we discovered. It was around this point I remembered I had left my bag back there. I didn't want to have someone find it and then find me. Maybe not the most logical thing to fear, but I digress. I was too scared to go back by myself, so I called my friends again. They reluctantly agreed to go back with me. As we approached the back door, fear was weighing heavily in our hearts. I reached my hand out and tried the door, only to be completely shocked when this time it was locked. This was about eight years ago now. I would often tremble in my bed at night when the lights were off, remembering our discovery in that hotel. It's now been torn down and changed into a set of retirement homes. I can still visualize that room in my head, that bloody mannequin, and all those deceased animals. I think about whoever killed those animals and stabbed that mannequin so many times. What was the purpose of that? Were they acting out some sort of sick fantasy? I guess I'll just never know. I was working late at the office one night. We have a big two-story building in a business complex, and sometimes if we have to catch a on work, we kind of have to stay late. I had taken two sick days the week before, and I had a project I really needed to get done. I didn't have much time left to do it. I planned to stay a few hours this night and a few hours the next night to get caught up on things. I was going to leave anywhere between 1 and 2 a.m. Often, others would be there late as well, but this night it just so happened to be only me. I was working at my desk, which was in the middle of a home room full of them. As I typed away on my laptop, though, I started to get a little drowsy. After fighting it for a bit, I got up to make some coffee in the break room. I started the machine and leaned against the table, barely able to keep my eyes open as it slowly poured into the mug. That was when a sudden loud thud shook me right awake. It sounded like it was downstairs, but it was really loud, resonating through the whole building. Nothing else followed that sound, though. It was just the one instance. I walked over to the doorway and looked out at the stairs, debating whether or not I should go see what that was. Honestly, I was so tired, I thought surely it was something falling in one of the rooms downstairs and chose not to investigate further. I grabbed my mug and went back to my desk, continuing to work. I sat there for an hour, doing non-stop work. The coffee wasn't really fixing my sleepiness problem, though. I kept working through, trying to power through everything, but I was only prolonging the inevitable. At some point, I dozed off at my desk. When my eyes opened again, I remember being immediately irritated and somewhat dizzy, like I'd been annoyingly woken up from a deep sleep. As I regained my senses, though, I noticed a sound coming from somewhere in the building. It was a beep, sounding every four or five seconds. It was very faint, though. I looked at my laptop and saw it was nearly 2 a.m. I decided it wasn't worth it trying to work any further tonight so I packed up my things and brought them with me. I left the room, both to check on this mysterious beeping noise and to leave the building. As I got to the stairwell, though, the beeping started to make me nervous. I'd never heard this sound before, and there was something eerie about it. Maybe I was too tired to fully comprehend. I walked down the staircase, and now the beeping sound was much louder. I peered into the long main hallway, and at the far end there was a metal rod laying on the ground right in front of the open entrance door. I felt blood rush from my face, knowing it should be locked up, and realizing that that beeping sound was the building's security system. 
with nothing but instinct to go off of, I ran down to the opposite end of the hallway and out the back door. I ran to my car to call for help. Although I was now out of the building, what I learned next was far more horrifying. Police eventually pulled in and searched around, not finding anyone or anything. That's when they checked the security cameras. At 11 p.m., a man could be seen walking up and busting the door wide open with a hit from some kind of tool, creating the loud banging sound I'd heard earlier while getting coffee. He then quietly moved around the first floor, then up to the second, where he came upon the office I was in. He stood there, quietly, only a few feet behind me while I was working at my desk. He then went back downstairs for a moment, coming up again while I was sleeping and walking around the whole office, even going right up to me and searching around me, even sniffing my hair. It's not clear if he stole anything, as there weren't cameras in every room, but there didn't seem to be any obvious answer as to what he was doing there. After seeing those horrifying security tapes, I never stayed alone at that office again. I grew up in a forestry cottage miles away from any town. We often got toads, birds, and other woodland creatures in the house out of the blue. I was seven at the time and suffered from night terrors. My parents often found me about the house at night, speaking nonsense or screaming. Must have really freaked them out to no end. For a few nights, I had been shouting that there was something in my bed. I couldn't sleep because of it. Obviously, my parents put it down to nightmares. I kept saying, though, something was shaking in my bed and scratching me. They took all my blankets and toys out to show me there was nothing there, but I was still convinced, and this kept happening. I was an odd child, so people often thought I was just making things up. Well, as it turned out, a rabid bat had somehow gotten into my duvet cover. I remember opening it up one night, and this thing just going crazy and flying out. My parents ran in and turned the light on to find this rabid bat dinging around the room. They had to take me down to the hospital to get my shots. Sometimes I'm still woken up in the middle of the night, and I feel like there's something biting at me from inside my blankets. Something scary happened when I went to visit my parents' new home. You might believe me, you might not, but this is the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. I was a student studying in Tokyo, and it was summer break, so I headed back to Okayama, a rural area in Japan. It had been about a year since I'd last seen my parents, and since I'd gone off to university, they'd moved house. So, this was all new to me when I came back. We used to live in a built-up area, but my parents had now moved out to the countryside. When I say countryside, I mean there was literally nothing around, except for forests and mountains. I got off the train, and my parents met me at the station. They drove me back to their new place, which took about 40 minutes or so. There was nothing but rice fields and a few residential areas along the way. There was nothing to do after the initial buzz of homecoming passed, and I grew bored quite quickly. I decided to take a walk to get to know the area a bit better. I did manage to find a convenience store, which was good. I walked alongside a river and then found a mountain. There looked to be a mountain trail, and this mountain didn't look that big. I had some time to kill, so I thought, why not climb a bit? I've got nothing better to do. I parked my bike at the entrance and started walking up the mountain. Well, it wasn't really high enough to be called a mountain exactly, but it wasn't a hill either. It took about 30 minutes to get to the summit. At the summit, there was this little park. I reached that park just as the sun was going down. 
I felt a bit dumb. I was used to the bright night lights of Tokyo, so when it got dark, I was never really bothered by it. Thing is, I'd forgotten I was in the countryside now, and when it gets dark there, it gets real dark real quick. It was turning pitch black in no time. Pitch black with me stuck up on top of this mountain. I didn't like the sound of that so much. I wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, before the last remnants of the sunlight disappeared into darkness. Since it had taken me about 30 minutes to climb up the summit, I thought maybe I could make it back down in 20 or so if I hurried up. I was about to scramble down the mountain's side when I heard a voice call out to me. It was a woman's voice. That was weird. I hadn't noticed anyone in the park at the summit. Where are you from? She asked. Huh, no hello or excuse me? What's up with that? When I turned to face this voice, I saw a woman standing there, grinning like mad. Uh, it's getting dark. I'd better head back now, I said. She didn't say another word. She just stood there grinning at me. I didn't like that. What kind of person stands there on the top of the mountain and grins at you? The strangest thing was that although her mouth was smiling, her eyes weren't, if you know what I mean. It was like a fake smile. I can't describe the uncomfortable feeling when our eyes met for a few moments. I backed up a bit. I really gotta get going now. I started heading down the mountain as quickly as I could. I was a bit worried the woman would follow me, but when I looked over my shoulder and saw she wasn't there, I was a bit relieved. When I got back to my bike, it was now pitch black. I was just about to reach out and grab the handles when I heard a voice call from behind me. What's your name? I spun around in an instant, only to find that creepy woman standing right behind me, studying me with her eyes, smiling this robotic smile. I swear I'd looked over my shoulder a dozen times as I went down the mountain, so I had no idea how she'd managed to either evade my sight or get down here so quickly and silently. I was really panicking now. Something about this was not normal at all. I didn't reply, so she asked me again with the exact same intonation. I said a common name, of course, a pseudonym. She didn't say anything in response. She just kept staring at me and smiling. Okay, well, I'm getting out of here now, I said, as I threw my legs over my bike and started pedaling as hard as I could without looking back. I wanted to try and calm down. My heart was racing. I pulled into the convenience store on the way home. I wanted to read a magazine or do something to distract myself. Afterwards, I went home with no further issue. I spoke to my mother about that encounter with the strange woman, but she didn't seem to believe me. She just laughed and said, Oh, did you see a ghost or something? I couldn't get that strange woman out of my head, though. The way she'd followed me, that horrible, insincere smile, it haunted me a lot more than I thought it would. I tried to think more logically about the situation. Maybe she was a local to the area. Probably she knew a shortcut down the mountain, and that's how she was able to pop up behind me so easily. Since she was a local, she probably knew everyone in town, and that's why she asked me my name, right? And where I was from? Perhaps she wasn't as creepy as I'd made her out to be in my mind, but something still felt off about this. I always trust my gut in these situations. I hung around my parents' home for about a week longer, then decided to head back to Tokyo. I was waiting to get on the bullet train when my heart sunk. I saw that same woman from the mountaintop, just on the other side of the tracks. She was wearing the exact same outfit as the night I'd seen her, only one thing was different. She wasn't smiling this time. There was absolutely no sense of expression on her face at all. She didn't realize I'd noticed her at first, but when she saw I was looking her way, she locked eyes with me, and that insane grin crept across her face immediately. It looked as if she was trying to say something to me, but I couldn't hear or make out what it was. 
she broke into a full-on sprint toward the station stairs in an attempt to get to my side of the tracks. She was barreling right toward me. When the train finally pulled in, I jumped on board and headed down the aisles, knocking into many people and barging them aside in an attempt to find a place to hide. I was terrified the whole journey back. I felt for sure she was on the train somewhere. In fact, I'm not entirely certain she wasn't. I got back to my home in Tokyo yesterday. I really hope I'll never see that woman again, but I can't get that creepy smile out of my head. This didn't happen to me, but it did happen to my dad back in the 70s. He told me this story one night while we were camping, so I'll try and tell it to you just the same way he did to me. I was walking home one night from a heavy night of drinking with my work colleagues. I was pretty worse for wear, so I decided to use a shortcut home at the time. It went through a park, which was on the mountainside. It cut straight through the mountainside as well. I was walking through when behind me I heard this weird clinking sound, like a hammer being banged against a rock or something. I turned around to see what exactly was making this mysterious noise as it seemed to be following me. Needless to say, I was very startled to turn around and find a woman creeping up behind me, holding a knife in her hands. The woman had long, dark hair, and she was chattering her teeth. She was bearing them almost like a chimpanzee. Upon seeing this in the darkness, I sprinted toward the first light source I set my eyes on. It just so happened to be a public toilet. All I could think to myself was, what the hell is going on? I prayed that someone else would be passing through the park, or maybe that there would even be a homeless guy wandering around. I'd never been so desperate for help in my life. The woman was gaining on me. I could hear her chattering teeth and her rasping breaths as she chased after me. I was terrified. I could hear the sounds of her swinging her knife in the air behind me. If someone was using that toilet, or if it happened to be out of order, I would surely be bottlenecked and trapped. Thankfully, it happened to be unlocked. I ran into the furthest stall on the right and tried my best to hide inside. There was a small frosted window, which let in some light. I couldn't see or hear the woman anymore, so I tried to keep as still as possible. I was trembling with fear, sweating profusely from running for my life. I felt as if I would vomit at any second. I kept as still as I could for 20 minutes or so, but there was still no sign of the woman. I'd started to calm down at this point. I looked at my watch and it was 2.45. I was so tired, so scared, I just couldn't keep up anymore. I felt so terrible that I shut my eyes for a couple of moments, intending to get some rest. Before I knew it though, I'd fallen asleep. I woke up there in the morning, pleased to see the morning light and find that I wasn't dead in my sleep. This isn't where my father's story ended though. It was about two days after, my father was reading the local paper when he came across a story. A woman had been arrested in that very same park he'd taken the shortcut through. An officer working the night patrol had found her and arrested her at around 3 a.m. He arrested her because he found her staring through the window of the public toilets, staring at my father. No doubt if that officer wasn't patrolling the park that night, he might not be alive to share that story today. And that's where the story ends, but it's definitely one of the most terrifying I've ever heard. This happened last year. It was the beginning of spring and we were going through a rainy month where pretty much every day there was some kind of downpour either light drizzling or full-on storms. I do deliveries for a popular restaurant in my area, so rain isn't the most amazing thing. 
when I have to be running through it all the time to pick up and drop off orders. This night started as any other. I got to work at 6 and drove around a couple of orders before getting one to deliver to a somewhat far away area. It was about 10 miles out from our restaurant, going into the more woodsy part of town. It wasn't all forest or anything like that. It was just more spread out and less densely populated. The roads were all covered by trees and most neighborhoods weren't visible from the main roads while driving through. On my way there, there was only one car behind me, which was not weird in any way. That's just how empty the road was. Once I got maybe two miles in though, the beam of someone's headlights in front of me came out of nowhere, revealing a car right in the middle of the road, swerving to stop. I slammed on my brakes. The car was sideways, blocking the whole road. The guy behind me did the same, stopping so close to me that I was surprised we didn't collide. After the initial moments of shock, I looked up at the car in the middle of the road. It was a beat up looking sedan, and they had their brights on, making it too blinding to see who was in the car. I'd say that whoever was in there, had to have been falling asleep at the wheel or something, maybe just not paying attention. Well, I would have said that, but they seemed to have intentionally left their headlights off until the very last moment, when they turned to block the road. I didn't see where they'd come from, it was too dark, and I wasn't sure if they'd been driving down the road or if they'd come out from a side road. The car behind me laid on their horn, Clearly frustrated by whatever this was, I probably should have been more skeptical, but in the moment when something crazy like this happens, it's hard to think straight. Either way, the car behind me was too close for me to move back, and the car in front of me was blocking the whole way forward. I couldn't do anything unless one of them moved. After a while of the guy honking behind me, he stopped and got out of his car. I looked in the mirror and saw a large man begin walking through the rain. He looked completely furious. He passed right by my car and walked up to the other one. He stood at their window angrily yelling at whoever was in there, but with the rain I could barely hear what he was saying. I couldn't hear anything of what the other person was saying either, if they were even responding. I saw the man outside bang on the window a few times as he yelled and yelled, but then suddenly he stopped altogether and went completely quiet. He slowly backed away from the window, then nervously walked back to his car. As he was getting in the driver's side, the other car door opened and a man stepped out, wearing a thick hoodie that covered most of his face. I was now getting really freaked out. I still had no way of leaving at all, other than running my car out into the woods, which was probably a horrible idea. I sat there and watched, as the man quickly made his way up to the car behind me. Just as he got to the door, the car floored it backwards and their tires screeched as they slid against the pavement. They lost control and slid off the side of the road. They made it past a few trees before slamming into one further into the woods. The man that was still on the road turned and looked at my car, making eye contact with me in my side mirror. I put my car in reverse and pressed on the gas, backing out past him. I then turned around and sped off. I obviously called the police, but I still had no idea what was going on there that night. An officer got to the scene about 15 minutes after I had left. The only thing they found there was the car wedged in the woods against a tree. The other car was long gone, and neither of the men could be found. I think we can all assume what probably happened without even having any reasoning to go off of, but there are still a million questions that need answers. All I can say is that if the other guy behind me wasn't there, I would likely be in whatever place he's in right now. When I was a high school student, there was an abandoned building seemingly perfect for urban exploration. It was right next to my school, 
and it was a pretty big building too. It had three floors, and I thought it used to be a dormitory or a hostel or something. My friends and I weren't exactly sure what it was supposed to be. We just called it the dormitory. Back in those days, we used to sneak out when we were supposed to be asleep. I still can't believe we did it so often, honestly. We used to go to the dormitory after midnight with flashlights in tow. It was a fairly common occurrence, and it was very popular in our group. We used to love daring each other to do spooky things. It seemed as if other people and groups of kids came there to do similar things as well. There were smashed windows, kicked in doors, etc. We were pretty sure that people were using air rifles in there and playing with paintball guns. We even found bullets scattered across the floor. One night we snuck out. I met my friends and we headed to the dormitory. We went in as usual. I was leading the group and we were shining our torches all over the walls and the floor inside. While we were walking, I was just kind of idly opening the doors of the rooms, getting a kick out of scaring my friends. When I got to the final innermost door on the first floor though, I reached out and put my hand on the doorknob. As soon as I touched it, my whole body went ice cold. I felt like something was off. Something was wrong here. I had the feeling I needed to throw up suddenly. I had to pause and crouch down for a moment. That feeling had never happened to me before, and it's never happened again either. I didn't know what was going on exactly, but something was telling me I needed to leave right now. I took it as a sign. I'm a bit superstitious like that. My friends were more than happy to leave with me. That incident really freaked us out a bit. Even when I got back home, I couldn't shake that cold feeling. The next day, I was back to normal though, and went back to student life. Everything was the same as it had always been. About a week later, I was shopping for some sports shoes with my dad, when we ran into a friend of mine. A friend who I often went urban exploring with in the dormitory. He pulled me aside to speak with me privately. Hey, did you know that a body was found in there? I was shocked. I think the other shoppers noticed my reaction. How could this have happened? I wondered. A story eventually made its way into the newspaper. It turned out that someone had been murdered inside, and their body was hidden in the dormitory. The body went undiscovered for ten days, according to the article. The police seemed to implicate some gang who had been known to hang out there. They were treating it as a murder. Soon, rumors ran rampant around the town about this incident. It was a real hot topic amongst my friends, too. One of my friends pointed out a chilling fact to our group at lunchtime. If the body was said to have been there for ten days, then when we were there prior to last week, the body must have been there, and not long dead either. The realization that we were so close to that corpse really frightened me. About a month later, all the talk about the murder eventually faded. Now that everybody knew it had been committed in the dormitory, though, they wanted to go there even more. To be honest, I was curious too. We waited until nightfall again, and we snuck inside. I was surprised we could get in so easily, with everything that had gone down there. I led the way once more, walking down that familiar corridor. We were looking for a sign of the incident, any sort of clue or indication, opening all the doors as usual. There was nothing. We finally arrived at the farthest innermost door again. I grabbed the doorknob. No sickening chills this time. I opened the door and there was nothing there. We moved forward into the room. I was shining my flashlight all over when I noticed something. I saw a white tape and an outline of a body on the floor. We ran for it. I suddenly understood the reason for my chills on that day. This happened about 12 years ago when I was a university student living in Tokyo. I'm originally from the countryside. 
I returned home during summer break and met up with my friends. We would stay up until the morning light, drinking and trying to chat up women, generally just having a good time. It was pretty great, honestly. One night, my friend and I took some girls to karaoke. We had a great time, and after it was over, none of us really wanted to go home yet. A smile crept over my friend's face. He looked over at all of us and asked, You guys feeling brave? He told us about an old abandoned villa up in the mountains. I had a driver's license and I didn't want to seem like a chicken in front of our girls. I agreed to go, even though I'd never do anything like that again. The villa has since been destroyed, but at the time it was pretty famous with the locals. There were urban legends spoken of around town. One went like this. Apparently a woman was murdered there, and if you went at night you would see a spooky woman peering at you from the window of inside the house. So, off we went. I think we were more excited than scared at the time. I'd guess it was around midnight by the time we finally arrived. Why the hell was there this random villa in the middle of the mountains, I thought. It looked completely out of place. I turned off the car's headlights to get a gauge of how dark it was out there. It was pitch black. I did start to feel a little nervous now. We were in a group though, so I didn't let it put me off on the idea too much. Late night urban exploration was always exciting. There was a barricade in front of the door, but we managed to break it down and go inside. The smell of dust and mold stung at my nose. There was broken glass everywhere, and the atmosphere inside was very heavy. It seemed like numerous people must have been there before, as there were spray paint all over the walls. It was pretty eerie, but I felt reassured that my friend was pretty skilled in martial arts. I wasn't exactly weak back then either. I guessed we would be prepared for any trouble, but I was wrong. We spent a while in the abandoned villa, looking around, smashing stuff up a bit, then we got tired and decided to head back to the car. We got back and listened to some music while chatting. Out of habit, I just so happened to lock the doors. I'm real glad I did. After a while, I noticed some headlights coming up the mountain in our direction. It looked like a car was pulling up. Who would be driving up here at 2 a.m.? I wondered to myself. I started to get a bit nervous. Maybe it was the police or something. Maybe we would get in trouble for trespassing. I asked my friends if they wanted to go now, but they said no. Let's just see what happens. The car arrived at its destination. It appeared to be a taxi. We were at a complete dead end. Why would someone take a taxi all the way up here? We were all asking each other about the taxi stopped just a few meters away from my car when suddenly two people stepped out of the back seats. One of my friends thought they must be the owners of this abandoned villa. They just kind of stood there, staring at us for a while. It was incredibly creepy. They then began to approach my car. One was a woman wearing a red one-piece dress, and the other was a man in a suit. I'd guess they were about 40 or so. I couldn't really see their faces since it was so dark out. I couldn't believe what I was seeing in front of me. It felt like a dream. The man just approached the driver's side door, and the woman approached the passenger side. All of a sudden, they both started violently trying to open the car doors. They were straining and struggling so hard that the car was actually shaking with how much force they were putting out. My hair was standing on end. Now you know why I was so glad I locked those doors. The door handles continued to rattle, and they began to bang on the windows. We were all terrified. I snapped out of my fear-induced daze when one of my friends screamed to drive. Let's get out of here! There was a lot of screaming. I started the engine. My friends were on the verge of tears as these two strangers kept trying to break into my car. Eventually, we got away and pulled into a family restaurant. Everyone was shaking and asking questions, but no one had the answers to them. 
After a while, we calmed down. We sat down in a restaurant with our drinks. I asked my martial arts friend why he didn't try to go out there and fight them. He's usually so full of confidence. He just said because he didn't think it was a fight he could win. I was living with a roommate in a house she had purchased. I had a habit of leaving my window open. It was the first floor in a safe neighborhood, or so I thought. I also had a screen on my window. One day, something inside me was telling me to close my window. A week later, I began to lock it. The night I just so happened to lock that window, my roommate had just gotten home from a work trip. I was downstairs asleep when I heard a smack against my window and the whole thing started jiggling. I turned the light on and ran upstairs to grab a bat. It turned out my roommate didn't even have that anymore. We both began to freak out. We looked outside but couldn't see anything there. I went back downstairs and tried to go back to sleep, but needless to say that did not happen. The next day, we went out to observe what had happened. My screen had been ripped off the window entirely and thrown down behind the houses toward the main street. Within the week, we installed a security system and got a gun for the house as well. Other than a couple false alarms by my chihuahua, everything seemed to be alright. Two weeks later though, a lady two streets down had been woken up to a man she'd never seen before standing over her in bed. He didn't attempt to hurt her and seemed to leave willingly when she told him to get out. He was like six foot six or something, which was exactly the right height for him to attempt to get into my room. Thank goodness they actually ended up catching that guy in the end. When I was around 17 years old, I had a weekend job. I was given $18 a weekend to unlock and lock my local Catholic church. I left my house at 5 a.m. on Saturday to unlock the doors, same on Sunday, and locked up the church at around 11 p.m. each night. One Saturday night, I showed up to lock the place up. Of course, locking up required a walkthrough of the church, which consisted of making sure all the lights were turned off, including the church's basement. So there I am walking through this basement, and as my footsteps were echoing against the concrete walls, I suddenly heard a second set of footsteps begin behind me. I stopped, and those steps stopped as well. I thought to myself, surely I'm imagining this, this was around the time that the first Scream movies came out, so those had made me quite paranoid. I started walking again, only to hear the footsteps behind me start as well. I hauled ass out of that basement. I ran as fast as I could and locked the door and went home. I told my parents when I got back, and they told me to call the priest. I did and left a message as well, but I didn't receive any response. The next day, Sunday, I headed over to the church again to lock up at 11 p.m. I did my walk through and was walking through the basement when the footsteps began behind me again. I stopped, I took several steps forward, and the footsteps seemed to follow my exact movements. I was wondering if maybe it could just be an echo or something when suddenly I heard a cough come from behind me. I ran out of there as fast as I could and swore I would never go back. Two weeks later, a story came out. A local woman had gone insane and thought her neighbor was worshipping the devil. She decided to move into the local Catholic church. She had been living in the basement and was literally stalking me every night when I was locking up. She thought I was some sort of intruder. She's now in a mental hospital. I think that's the closest I've ever come to dying.
It was Friday night back in 2018. I was working at home on a paper I needed to finish for work and was trying to get it done so I could enjoy my weekend. I didn't want to have to worry about it anymore. It was probably somewhere around 10 p.m. or so at this point. I'd been working in my office for a good three hours now, and this was after a full day already too. I was getting pretty exhausted. I kept finding myself getting distracted or losing focus. I paused what I was doing and stood up to stretch my legs and try to wake myself up a bit. I paced around the room, but as I passed by the wall opposite my desk, I noticed some movement in the window. I stopped and did a double take, looking out the window again. I was on the second story of my home, but the window had a view of the front portion of the property, just by the garage and porch. At first, I didn't really see anything. I thought my mind must have been playing tricks on me but then I saw that tiny bit of movement yet again. There was a shadow hovering over the sidewalk leading up to the porch. It seemed someone was standing outside my front door, or at least that's what it looked like from here. After continuing to look out the window for a couple of minutes and seeing the shadow barely move at all, I left my office and went downstairs. I leaned on the front door and checked out the peephole, there was a man outside, looking to be about 40 years old. He was bald, with a big scruffy gray beard. I watched for a moment, but he never knocked nor rang the doorbell. In fact, he wasn't making any noise at all. He was just standing there outside my front door. What started freaking me out more, though, was that I had no idea how long he'd been out there. I had been working the whole time, and I'd never noticed him until just a couple of minutes ago. Wanting some answers as to why the man was here, I opened the door. Immediately I was taken aback, because the man didn't even flinch at all. His face stayed the exact same, cold and lacking emotion. Hey, what are you doing here? I said in a stern tone. The man just continued to stare, but didn't answer. His eyes had this thousand-yard stare until they moved past me and looked down the hallway into my home. I moved the door further in toward my body to hide the view. I don't know why you're here, but you need to leave right now. I closed the door firmly in his face. His strange behavior was both creepy and aggravating. Him ignoring me, just standing there and staring off into space, made me really weirded out. I then heard his footsteps begin walking off the porch and away from the house. I sighed in relief and checked to make sure he'd really gone away. I then went back up to my office, trying to forget about that strange man and focus back on my work once more. I continued where I left off, when about five minutes later, just as I was really beginning to get into it, a sudden knock echoed through the house. It was coming from the front door, but the knocks were quite loud, like someone was banging on it with their whole fist. Irritated, I got up and quickly ran down to the front door, swinging it open aggressively with the intent to yell at the man. When I saw him, I quickly changed my mind, though. Something about the look in his eyes and the way he was standing instantly shifted my anger into fear. I looked down to his hands, seeing him holding something against his side, as if trying to conceal it from me. All I could make out was the top of a small handle, resembling that of a knife. I looked back up at him, only to see his whole body jolt toward me. I jumped back and slammed the door shut. I then fought to lock it, as the man began to try and force his way in from the other side. Once I got the handle and deadbolt latched, the man started banging on the door again, before eventually running away. I stood there with barely any breath in me, feeling my adrenaline surging through my body. Shakily, I went to the office and called 911. I never saw the man again after that, and no real answers as to what happened that night were ever discovered.
Every year, the kids who live in the neighborhood come trick-or-treating on Halloween night. It's something the parents plan each year. I open the door year after year to kids dressed as zombies and witches, who would gleefully exclaim trick-or-treat. I got really into the spirit, even though we don't really celebrate Halloween as much as some other countries. I look forward to Halloween each year, and I always made sure I had lots of candy for the neighborhood kids. There was always a large number of them knocking on my door. Last year was no exception. Something happened, which made it a Halloween night that I will never forget, though. The doorbell rang just as usual. I took a quick peek through my curtains to see who was out there. It was a pretty tall kid that was trick-or-treating. He had come dressed as a ghost. He was all alone. I had already handed out candy to the other neighborhood kids, so I guessed he must have been running late or something. I answered the door and said nothing, expecting him to say trick-or-treat like all the other kids. Instead, he didn't say anything. He just kind of stared at me. I could see his eyes through the holes in the bedsheet he was wearing. I broke the silence by saying, I'll go get you some candy. I turned and left that kid at my door. I went to get the candy. I was so surprised that I nearly dropped the bowl of sweets entirely when I turned around and saw that kid had wandered into my house without my permission. He was standing directly behind me. I hid my shock and irritation. I smiled and handed over some sweets. Maybe this kid's parents never taught him about not going into people's homes uninvited. Here you go, buddy, I said. Usually when kids get some candy, they would say thank you, but this guy just stood there staring at me. Wow, this kid's pretty weird, I thought. Looking closer, I noticed his costume was very shabby and dirty, even though I had given some candy. They hadn't turned to leave. I heard heavy breathing and watched as his ghost costume inflated and deflated. My heart started beating faster. I could smell some horrible smell. Halitosis for sure. It was gross. It was coming from this guy. I looked closer at the two eye holes of the costume. This guy's eyes were bloodshot. I then noticed his hand which held the candy. His fingers were thick and big boned, not childlike at all. It was at this moment I realized I was not dealing with a kid, but an adult who had wandered into my house uninvited. A second passed by before he whipped off his ghost costume. Now I could see his full face. Standing before me was a bearded man. He bared his teeth at me almost like a dog. He looked so furious. In his other hand, something shone in the light of my living room, a large knife. Without a thought, I screamed my lungs out. He looked worried. He spun around as if checking to see if anyone had noticed. Then he ran. I collapsed to the floor, absolutely terrified. I made a police report, but I heard nothing in terms of an arrest. The man is still out there, and Halloween is coming around again. Now the leaves are falling, and the nights are getting darker and colder. Ever since that event, I've really started to worry about who will be out trick-or-treating this year. It was Halloween night in Shibuya. If you've seen the news reports or been there in person, You'll know all about the huge gatherings of people in fancy dress costumes. Maybe not this year though, I guess. I want to tell you about the scariest thing that's ever happened to me, back in 2017. I'm a woman, by the way. My friends and I decided we would go to Shibuya in costume. We saw hundreds of others, all gathered around the famous crossing dressed up in their Halloween finest. The October air was full of enthusiasm for the holiday. It was so crammed with so many people. As we walked across the crossing, I could smell sweat and alcohol. My feet were being trampled on over and over. There was garbage everywhere. I was kind of regretting coming at this point. 
The oncoming crowd pushed past me, and it separated me from my friends. I started searching for them as best I could, but when everyone's wearing masks and costumes, it's difficult. Everyone around was just completely drunk and stumbling everywhere. I didn't stand a chance of finding them like this. I decided to find a less crowded area, and there I would try to text or call them. Before I knew it, I had entered an empty back alley with no one around. I took a deep breath and tried to calm down and compose myself. I was pretty annoyed at the situation. I could hear the noise coming from the crossing area still. As I started to calm down, a shabby man began to amble towards me and sat down close by. Had he been there the whole time, I wondered? I couldn't figure out if he was in a costume or what he was supposed to be. He looked kind of like a shaman or something. He had long, greasy hair. I looked closer, and honestly, it looked like he was wearing bits of costume he'd found out on the street. Some parts were like a witch's costume. Then there were the bright polka dot tights, a fancy hat, other parts that looked like a clown's costume. Very weird. Nothing about his costume matched at all. As he stared at me, I just ignored him. I tried to walk away and passed him, and then he did something I really didn't expect. He shot right up to his feet and grabbed my arm hard. He blocked my path and whispered in my ear, Give me some candy. I couldn't move at all. I tried to wriggle free from his grasp, but he was so strong. His words were slurred, and he sounded in a daze. It was truly horrifying. I didn't know what else to do so I rooted through my bag looking for something to give him. Haven't you heard of trick or treat? You don't want a trick, do you? He was slurring. It was at this point I noticed he'd pulled his hand out of the pocket of his hoodie and he was brandishing a knife. I didn't know if it was one of those fake knives or not, but I surely didn't want to find out. Sweat was running down my face. He chuckled and repeated again and again his trick or treat. I was still blindly searching in my bag for some candy when I saw someone dressed as a police officer. I screamed for help at the officer. He looked my way and walked down the alley towards us. The weird guy who had a hold of me just stared at the oncoming person. Thank God I'm saved, I thought to myself as he walked over. What's the matter, miss? The guy called out as he approached. Are you not giving this man his candy? He gave a smile and pulled a gun out of his side holster. He aimed at my head. Trick or treat, he grinned. I'd never felt so helpless in my life. I felt betrayed and alone. I felt as if this was the end for me. I didn't know what to do. There was no one around, and everyone in earshot would never hear me if I screamed. They might not even hear the sound of the gun. I was still absent-mindedly rooting through my bag, when my finger touched something. Just as the man with the gun approached me and put his hand on my wrist, I flung it out of my bag onto the floor. They both let go of me and scrabbled around on the floor to reach this thing. I ran as fast as I could back to the crowd of people, and eventually I was reunited with my friends. I have no idea what happened that night, who those people were, or if it was a prank. Either way, it was horrible. I really do hope it was just a prank. I was invited to Halloween in Shibuya the next year, and of course I politely declined. Just because there are many people around in the center of a city doesn't mean it's a safe place. Please take care out there, guys. Way back in 2013, I was 22 years old. I wanted to sell an old computer I had. It wasn't good enough to take into a shop or anything. It was kind of a piece of junk that I thought someone else could find use of. At the time, Craigslist was the only place I really knew of that you could post and sell things on. Honestly, I'd never heard any bad things happening from it. 
It seemed like an easy to access site that people nearby could get discounts from and I trusted the area I lived in as well. I really had no second thoughts when I listed the PC on the site. It only took a day before I received an email from someone willing to pay me that listed price. Of course, that's assuming it worked as I said it did. I assured him that he could test it out when he picked it up, and we set up a time to do the exchange. It was the following morning. He said his name was Cameron, and he'd send me an email when he was on his way over. On the next day, I got up early and waited until 11 a.m., when he was supposed to show up. I was expecting his email to say he was coming, but he never sent anything. At 11.15, with still no email and no signs of him even coming, I decided to open up the blinds and watch TV, while keeping an eye outside just in case he did show up. There was nothing, until about 11.45. From the corner of my eye, I saw a car slowly coming down the road and up to the front of my house. They stopped right on the curb, keeping the car running. Thinking that must be him, I paused the TV and waited, but several minutes passed by and the car didn't move or turn off. Suddenly, they turned back onto the road and drove away. I got up and went over to the window, looking out and not really understanding what that just was. I didn't know if it was Cameron or just some random person that just happened to coincidentally stop there for some reason. I closed the blinds and sent an email, asking if he was coming or not. There was never any response. After an hour, I was done waiting. I went on with my day, forgetting about the whole thing. I had lunch and eventually dinner, then got in bed early, around 9pm or so. I had to work the next day. I fell asleep quickly, but woke up some time after. I looked at the clock and it was only 11 p.m. It had barely been two hours. I closed my eyes again and tried to get back to sleep, but a very faint thumping sound forced my eyes open. I stayed laying there quietly, waiting to hear another so I could figure out what it was. Only a moment later it came again. It was coming from somewhere downstairs, but it wasn't something I'd heard before. I had no idea what it could be. Worried there may be a problem with the house, I got up and went into the hallway, then over to the stairs. I heard it several more times as I made my way down. It also started to get louder, being much more than just a quiet thump. I slowed down, stepping quietly through the kitchen and turned the corner into the back hall. As I stared down the dim hallway, Another thud rang through the house from directly at the end. When my eyes adjusted, I could see the faint outline of a figure moving outside the window. My heart stopped for a second, then another heavy thud shook it, causing me to jump and step back. The figure stood still and faced the window. Then the shadow became more clear as they leaned their face in close pressing against the glass. I saw their eyes lock onto me. That moment of horror felt like it lasted for minutes, but I know it was only a second or two before they backed up and sprinted away. I ran and called the police, but they had obviously gotten away by then. Despite it seeming like an easy case of it being the man from Craigslist, Cameron, it wasn't so simple. There really was no evidence of being him, other than it happening on the same day I was supposed to meet him. I don't know what that person wanted either, but the bolt holding the window down had divots on the outside, as if they were trying to break it out of the window sill. I never found out anything else, but I also never took to using Craigslist again. I want to share a story about the time my family's house got broken into. It was a really creepy experience. It happened one dark October evening when I was in high school. 
Back then, whenever I got home from school, I would go up to my room and lie down on my bed, then read some manga for a while. On the day of the break-in, it was just me in the house. My family had gone shopping, so I shut myself away in my room and lost myself in my books. It was actually great. I needed to go to the toilet at one point, though, so I left my room. That's when I noticed something quite strange. There was the smell of tobacco smoke hanging in the air. That was really weird, since obviously I didn't smoke, and nobody in the family smoked either. I had never smelt this before in my house. I went in search of the source of this smell. I began my search in my little sister's room. As I approached it, I noticed the door was slightly ajar when it should have been closed. I pushed open the door and switched on the light, only to be surprised when there standing before me was a fully grown man. This guy was in our house, and in my little sister's room no less. He was holding shoes in one hand, and was rummaging through my sister's drawers with the other. I guess he had taken his shoes off so he could move around more quietly. My heart just about stopped. My skin went ice cold. Somehow, I managed the courage to croak out, What are you doing in here? The guy immediately started babbling, creating random excuses, none of which were really possible. It was really crazy. My heart rate was really raising now. I didn't know what to do. I ran over and grabbed the man by the arm. I didn't want him to be able to escape. He didn't seem to resist or complain at all. He just kept silent. Luckily, my granddad lived close by, so I tied the intruder's hands behind his back and took him with me to his house. When we got there, my granddad called the cops. After some time, the police arrived, and they filled us in on all the details after they interviewed him. It turns out the man lived in an apartment just across the street that had a direct view into our house. Things got really creepy when he told the police he had actually been in our home several times. He said he enjoyed breaking in, even when there were people in the house. During the police interview, the man broke down and confessed his main purpose. The reason he trespassed several times was that he was drawn to my sister. He had some sort of obsession with her. He told the police that the day I'd apprehended him, he was looking for some of her underwear to take back to his apartment. He said the only reason he'd picked my sister was due to the simple fact that she was his type. He'd confessed to entering other people's homes too. Anyone who was his type, he'd follow them until they arrived home and later break in. The only reason he went unnoticed by the occupants in the houses was because he was very careful to not disturb anything nor steal a thing so no one knew he was coming or going. It seemed that this guy had a deep understanding of our family's movements and schedule, and many other people's schedules as well. It was clear he had been watching our house and us for a long time. He knew how to get in easily. He must have researched for a weak point of entry. He had done this so many times without ever being caught. My guess was that he began to get careless, he thought I'd left with my family, which was how I was able to catch him. I only caught him due to the cigarette smell. I can't tell you how terrifying it is to find someone you've never seen before standing in a dark room of your house. Especially when you're that age. I literally can't explain just how frightened I was. Of course, we threw away all of my sister's underwear and decided to get her new clothes too. I mean, how could she be comfortable wearing anything that man might have touched? I think my sister really suffered mentally because of this too. I didn't really try to speak to her much about it after though. I thought it might just hurt her more. I'm just glad I caught the guy. Who knows what else he might have wanted to do besides just stealing clothes. Maybe that was just the beginning. I don't even want to think about it. My neighborhood growing up wasn't the nicest. 
Everyone who lived there was there because they couldn't afford to be anywhere else, not because they wanted to live there. A lot of the houses were extremely small and old, and even the businesses in the town had trouble staying open for more than a year or two. When I was young, it was pretty common for us to go to these houses and businesses that had been abandoned and just mess around in them. The police had to have known this was going on, since every kid in town was doing it, but they didn't do anything about it. Anyway, when I was really young, my elementary school shut down, and the building was never repurposed. When I was older and exploring these rundown places, I was intrigued to see what the school looked like nowadays. On a Saturday night, my buddy Ryan and I went down to the school. We didn't have cars, so we had to walk about four miles from his house to get there. This building, even before it was abandoned, well, I always found it a little bit creepy. It was right on the edge of town, buried in the woods with a chain-link fence around it. It just really didn't seem like the sort of place for an elementary school. We climbed over that fence and went to the side of the building to see if there was a window to get in from. Luckily for us, almost every window had been smashed already. I jumped in first, followed by Ryan. The first thing we did was stand there and listen to hear if anyone else was inside. There was this very loud, hollow, creaking noise the building was making but it sounded like we were alone. We walked down the hallway, peeking into some of the rooms. It was a very strange feeling to be at the school after so many years and see it in such horrible condition. We passed maybe three rooms walking slowly and quietly before a sudden loud thud echoed throughout the entire building. We stopped and looked at each other, but no more sounds came. Brian said it was probably just the building settling in on its own way. We continued down the hallway. A lot of the rooms were either empty or just had a bunch of chairs lined up in them, but nothing really interesting. That was until we got to the next hallway, deeper into the school. This hallway had chairs scattered throughout, blocking the way. We had to push them all aside just to get to the rooms. The first one we found was locked, so we went over to the second room on the left side. We looked in, seeing what looked like clothes hanging from the ceiling. I walked inside and looked at these, unsure as to why or how they got there. After a moment, I wondered why Ryan hadn't said anything. If he was seeing what I was seeing, surely he would have something to say. I turned around, and as my head moved across the room, I caught a glimpse of a figure in the far back. I shot my eyes to the far wall, seeing a man staring at us. He stood there with something in his hands. To make it all worse, he had no clothing on. I glanced over at Ryan, who had his eyes fixed on this man as well. He grabbed my arm and pulled me back into the hallway. Immediately, we heard the sound of something metal being thrown across the room toward the door. That was followed by a horrific, animalistic scream. We sprinted down the hallway and out the first open window we saw, then ran as far away as we could before losing our breath. On the rest of the walk home, we put the pieces together and realized the man was likely holding some sort of weapon, which was probably what he tried throwing at us. Considering his unstable state, it's likely the man was really dangerous and had we stayed any longer or not noticed him, we may not have made it out at all. I used to work in an elementary school after school program in the town I went to college in. The town was known for the type of population it had. Most of the families were low income with many gang affiliations. The kids were wonderful for the most part, but the surrounding area was just awful. We had a good relationship with the police in town, and we would immediately get a call from them if there were any Amber Alerts or known baddies on the loose near us. 
One day, we were all out playing on the basketball courts when a white van with blacked out windows pulled up down the street. It was pretty beat up, but I didn't think much of it at first. Most of the cars that lined the street were ratty anyway. I continued playing with the kids until it was time to go inside for a snack. As we were walking in, one of the kids thought it would be a good idea to kick the ball as high as he could. The ball flew up high and landed in the street near the van. I escorted the kids inside and went back for his ball. As I headed back, two of the kids from the school were walking home. They passed by the van, and it started to shake a bit. I called out to them to say hello and tell them to enjoy their evening. I went to grab the ball when I saw a man jump back in the van. I grabbed the ball and looked up, only to find this man staring right at me. I ran over to those girls and walked them the rest of the way home. I also took down the license plate as the van sped off. I returned to the school after ensuring the girls got home safe. As I walked inside the door, the lady in charge of the program was just getting off the phone with the police. They told us to go into lockdown. A man was spotted in the area with a white van, and he was suspected of kidnapping and murdering three other children in the county. The description matched the man I saw. The van matched. The license plate matched. I immediately called the police back and told them he was there. They searched for him but never found him, as far as I know. I moved away from that town a few years ago, and I never heard anything else about it. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. I know it's been quite a while since I did an outro. Uh, if you guys like this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback about the video itself, please be sure to leave it in the comments below. I always do read the comments, although with me recording every day, I don't have as much time to respond to them anymore. Uh, if you guys have a story you would like to send in yourselves, please be sure to look in the description below the video. There will be links to my Facebook, Twitter, and Gmail accounts. You can go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to your story as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is, the type of story, if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description of the video the story appears in. Also, please be sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with, and as much correct grammar as possible, to ensure the best chances of your story appearing in a video. I think that's about it for this video here. Let me know if you guys have any thoughts about the channel or anything, and thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you guys have a great day.